and uh, good morning to council. So, uh, so as the mayor already said today, it's kind of a, it's a dual purpose uh, report. We, um, Christine's going to talk about the servicing aspect, and then also, uh, as you saw in the report, it it identifies Smith. It has a couple options for a site, specific site selection for the activity reception center, and. Uh, so what we really need today is a, a decision from council as to where you would like the, the reception center placed on that site. And it's still subject to uh, the rezoning application that would come forward uh, probably in six to eight weeks. And, uh, and I've also connected with Grand Spirit and uh, showed both options to Grand Spirit and they're fine with uh, whatever council decides. You know, the, the main thing they would like is land for, uh, for their building sites. So with that, I'll just uh, let Christine walk through and I think we'll have, uh, uh, I know Joe's on uh, online as well. If we have any questions about the rezoning down the road, and I think Stephanie will be joining us as well if there's any questions about the activity center. So thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Okay. Thanks, Director Miller. Uh, Ms. Donnelly, hello. Welcome, Christine. Hello, thank you. Um, so uh, funding has been approved to upgrade Park Road and 92nd Avenue adjacent to the Smith subdivision. This project includes extending uh, services simultaneously with the road construction, making a parcel owned by the city ready for development. So this Smith site parcel has recently been approved for the activity and reception center, as Arlen mentioned. And I was hoping to share my screen, see if it works now. No, I don't, it, I don't have ability to share my screen. So I'm wondering if someone could share their screen. Sure, thanks, uh, Christine. Um, basically, I, I can speak through just, it. Hold on, just have a second. We, I'm sure we can give you that ability. Uh, Director Bork, uh, I've, have you passed that over to Ms. Donnelly? Should try again. Okay. Oh, got it. Great, thank you. Um, there. Did that work? No. Oh no. Oh, here. There we go. Now, we're, now we've got it. Perfect. So Helix Engineering has provided uh, three concepts for the parcel to be developed and serviced, and they're attached to the report. Concept one was previously presented. It was tailored towards a high density residential, and it's no longer uh, recommended. Concept two, and three, uh, primarily the main difference is they do not include an internal connector road. All the servicing for these parcels would be provided from Park Road. Uh, concept two that's on the screen there shows the activity center parallel to, in the north lot and parallel to Park Road. <coughs> so concept three proposes the activity center in the southern lot parallel to the soccer field. Both two and three, again, they would be all serviced off Park Road. It's recommended council direct administration to proceed with concept three for the servicing of Smith, including the placement of the activity center on parcel, or sorry, on the proposed lot three, subject to the rezoning application process. Okay, thanks very much, Ms. Donnelly. Um, any uh, questions for Ms. Donnelly? Yeah, Councillor Pallott. Sorry, Councillor Pallott. Yeah, you'll just have to use the Council Chambers audio and make sure your mic's on there. I think that's where we're getting our audio from. Sorry about that, Bill. So yeah, I'm just wondering if there was any thought about making that building slide south? Um, just so we'd have a parking lot that would actually be beside the rotary field instead of on the other side of the building. Um, and what our thoughts are with lot three in general, if we are keeping lot three now or if lot three is still going to be for sale uh, with this carved out. Tim's probably Okay, so yeah, I, we could hear the feedback you guys were getting there. Um, Christine, were you able to hear uh, Wade's question? Uh, most of it. So, so give it a shot and we'll see if there's any more that we needed to do. Okay, so through the chair, um, I think I heard if we looked at moving this building south, like further south, yeah. um, and we did look at that 
the 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 challenge was more about um, hoping we could have access from Park Road to the parking lot, and uh, this dimension up here was kind of the minimum of what was required to have the building parallel to the soccer field. So if we start moving it south, then we potentially have to make the lot larger so vehicles could get around behind it or else look at access off 93rd Street. Um, so this it, this isn't a final decision at this point. Um, it's just a, a proposed lot, and there are definitely different ways of doing it that would occur or be looked further at it a development permit, but it's, the lot was more of what was put forward. Okay, so, so if I can, I, just want, I guess what I'm curious, so then lot three is what we're saying in the entirety is going to be set up for this rec facility and future future area for that? Like lot three is not sellable, we're, we're gonna be using that as parking lot and potential growth for this area or potential growth for this, for this facility? Yeah, uh, Ms. Donnelly or Director Miller, which, who wants to handle that? Uh, Sorry, I can uh, chime in here. Thanks, Sam, you're given. It was a little hard to hear uh, Councillor Palat. Could he repeat the question, please? So, yeah, you bet. Sorry about that. So I'm just curious if lot three is meaning now that it's entirely part for the rec centre. Uh, yes, I can, I'll respond to that. Uh, so our intent is lot three would be uh, entirely for the rec centre. So it would be parking spaces plus uh, the actual building site. I know we have had some feedback provided already about moving it forward. And the placement that you see in front of you, that was just, uh, we worked with engineering and uh, they put it down there, but we could certainly adjust that like Christina said and uh, move it forward a little bit. And uh, you know, we'll work with engineering and planning to, uh, to find the best placement for the building. Okay. Councillor O'Toole, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, so I understand that this uh, lot one and lot two will be uh, future housing. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm getting the vibe that uh, lot three will be a shared parking lot for anything that goes into lot uh, one and two as well. Correct or not? Uh, I can respond to that. Uh, our, no, our intent is that it'll be... Uh, It'll be for the activity center as well as for, and we anticipate people using the soccer fields most likely will park there as well and they'll park on 93rd street, but uh, it's related to uh, activities, but lot two and lot one would be for the, the housing parking, the building sites and the parking. But uh, our intent isn't that they use lot three. Okay, thank you so much. That's good news. Any other questions? Councilor Bresti, then Councilor Plot. Great, thank you. I'm just curious as you're planning out this site, site, how many parking spots are you assuming are gonna be built for the activity center? Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, in working with uh, facilities, we anticipate probably about 150 parking spaces is what we would uh, ask for as part of the, the build. And I guess just my comment there is that seems like a lot to me in terms of my understanding of this facility is that at least where I want to see it is I want to see it used for drop in sports and ca and casual sporting and recreation events, not for big tournaments, not for big draws. And I just can't see anything that I imagine being in this building that would require 150 spots. Uh, I can uh, respond to that as well. We did, uh, thanks Mayor Gibbon. In talking to planning and development, we had a fairly wide range of uh, parking spaces that is required to meet the land use bylaw or the requirements under that. It, uh, and then we also did a, a bit of a scan with other municipalities looking at what the range should be. We started off at about 90 spots and we, on the high end, it could be as high as uh, upwards of 400 spots. But uh, so we landed at 150, we're not, it's not written in stone, it could certainly be adjusted still. But, uh, and then it might, uh, part of the adjustment might come down to the cost of the asphalt. We might uh, not be able to afford 150 parking spaces either. Great, so then I, I guess the question for me is that's, that's actually really concerning for me to hear. I think that's probably way too many parking spots, but are there gonna be further decision points for council or is this, we're approving this today and then we're, then we're hands off. I'm just trying to decide what I want to, might wanna make motions about today. Mr. Miller? Like, 
No, thanks, Mayor Given. So uh, just with the tight timelines and uh, the amount of work that has to be done and uh, I guess the responsiveness that we're anticipating will have to be uh, on the part of administration, our intent is that we will not come back to council asking for uh, different decision points. We're hoping today we'll have enough direction to, to proceed with the project. So uh, just if I may, Mayor Given? Just yeah, go ahead, and then I've got Councillor Plot and then Councillor Clayton. Yeah, it, it is along the same lines what I've already been asking. And so I'm just kind of curious, I really understand the need to approve the building and the building and get going and get out of your folks' way so that you can get that building up. I really understand that. My very layman's understanding and assumption, though, is that the parking lot probably wouldn't be as urgent to, as urgent to get going and get planned, but I could be completely wrong for that. So I'm kind of curious what it would do to your timelines if... Council said today, all right, great, you're good to go ahead for the building. We, you don't need to touch base again about the actual building and where it goes, but we'd like to talk further about parking. Would that kill your timelines and be really concerning, or do you think there'd be ability to have that conversation? Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. So our, uh, I think Council's obviously aware that the budget is uh, $4 million for the project, so the RFP that we plan on putting out within a week or so, will it'll be all encompassing. It'll be the building site plus the parking space. So in fairness to the bidders, we want them to know up front the, the size of the building, what we want in the building, as well as what we want for parking uh, spaces. So so they can price it accordingly, not because uh, we're hopeful that we don't have to come back to council and ask for additional funds. Okay. Uh, thank you. So I've got uh, Councillor Plot, Councillor Clayton, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. I'm similar to Councillor Bressy. I'm confused. I appreciate we want to get the lot decided. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why I'm getting so much feedback here. I re so, uh, council, so if anybody has in council chambers has the speakers going on their device that they're, you know, that is doing their Zoom, uh, you should be just getting all, I think, all the audio from the council chamber system. You should hear us through that, and you should hear. Uh, we should hear you through your council chamber's mic. Um, so I, I think I saw IT out yeah, in there sort of walking around. Yeah, we've got IT troubleshooting some devices. Uh, yeah, we don't seem to get it through Councillor Bressy's uh, uh, device there. So, Am um, I getting feedback now? Yeah, no, no big deal. We'll just get it set this one time, and then that'll make it easier for every other Sorry about question. that. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm kind of with Councillor Bressy. I can appreciate we're trying to get the location set. I'm just not sure. I think we need to rush to get it to RFP on a parking lot and everything. I'm, I was more worried about getting the building located in the land that we get that started. I'm not sure what the risk would be if we said, hey, by December 1st, we need to go to RFP on paving this and where the location is. I just... I'm concerned about the location of the building with on that lot, and I'd, and I'd like to have a conversation about it. Maybe it is just today, but I, I guess I need to understand from administration what the difference is if we're not paving this till April, May, probably, why we need to decide now. Director Miller? Thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think Joe Johnson was on the line. I, I assume he's still there, but... In the discussions with uh, planning and the discussions with Lanny uh, from facilities as well, we thought it was, uh, like I've already said, for the cost of a complete package. And then uh, the land use bylaw, I, I believe, does speak to uh, development and uh, the requirement when you build a site that you have to uh, also include the parking space, the parking lot, and to meet certain standards. But uh, Perhaps Joel could comment on that. But we're trying to follow the follow the processes that we ask all the other developers to do, and say this is what we're building. This is how it's going to look at the end of the day, including the, the parking lot as well as landscaping, so that the city isn't criticized by uh, other developers saying, "Hey, you didn't follow the exact uh, process that we make others do." But maybe Joel can help out on that. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, yeah. Arlen captured a lot of uh, a lot of the comments there. Uh, the one thing I will add is that this is a, a bit of an unusual facility in that our parking calculations may not be entirely uh, reflective of the demands. Uh, so as Arlen had indicated, we did do a little uh, survey of what other municipalities might 
uh, might look at. And thankfully, the land use bylaw for that specific use contains a clause that says um, th that allows the development officer to figure out what is a reasonable calculation. So as opposed to just having a, a strict formula that we have to follow and then if we fall short of that, then we run a variance. We're able to apply some discretion and, and I think avoid the variance route. Um, however, um, <clears throat> we do want to capture a reasonable amount of stalls that would that would meet the demand. And so we'll we'll look to we'll continue kind of just scouring other municipalities' land use bylaws, seeing what they might uh, what they might require. And then in terms of how many parking stalls you feel that you ultimately need, that could affect where you uh, locate the, the building in that you, you'd want to optimize the site and make the most sense for how, how the parking is configured given the irregular lot shape and whatnot. So I think there's some, some work that we just need to dig into and, and to fix the building site and the number of stalls right now, I think would be a real challenge. We're just looking at where, what site, approximately where on the property we're going to put this thing and then start to fill in the blanks. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. So I think I had Councillor Clayton, Councillor Friesen. Yeah. Sorry, Mary. I just, I guess if I can, and one other one on that is I'm just, um, I guess I didn't hear enough in there that I feel that we need to rush this and not to knock administration. I just, I think if we had a December 1st date, we'd be fine to get this to, mar to market by May when we're starting it. Um, my other comment is, uh, I'm wondering if the building needs to be turned instead of it running east to west, running north south. And, and the reason I'm throwing that out there has been there's been a few conversations with a few of us about what if we potentially at, at some point want to add on an outdoor uh, setup to this. And so if we if we leave the building where it's configured currently, we can't go north. And if we have the parking lot butted up to its south, we basically have got this building now. Uh, it's landlocked. It can't. We can't add to it in any capacity. So, I'm wondering if there's a, if there, anybody else has an appetite to see this building go north south, so we could potentially add to the east of the building, have the parking lot set back, um, and go from there. I'm fine with 150 stalls. I think it's probably. I feel it's maybe a little bit over on this site, but I think we'll have a lot of people very happy in that area because we'll actually have somewhere for for soccer parents to park. But uh, I'm just wondering if there's any thought about moving this thing north south, and if and if we can potentially then we could make it more scalable to add on to it if we did in the future want to add on to it. Sure. So who wants to speak to building siting, like building location on this site? Is that you, Joe, or Christine, or Arlen? Arlen? Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, I think we're open to. Uh, just hearing what council has to say today, certainly. So if uh, if council gives us direction to move it the other way, then uh, we could, if we move it north south, we could add on to it in the future towards the south. If we left it uh, in the, I guess the top corner of uh, lot three. The other thing I just want to comment on is, uh, you know, we we do have a timeline mapped out with working with procurement, and we have so many projects uh, coming up with procurement that we uh, we're very close to having the RFP ready. In talking to uh, uh, Lori Gadette as well, she's a little bit con concerned about supplies and depending on what building we decide to go with, if it's steel fabric, then uh, supplies will come out of the States most likely. So our opinion or our thoughts are the sooner we can get this out on the market, the, the better off we're going to be. And, uh, and then we it allows for, the other thing we've talked about in the past is with Doing the servicing at the same time we're doing the construction of the site could cause some conflict between the construction companies or the contractors. So we're just hoping to get as, uh, you know, as much, I guess, uh, notice on moving forward with the project as possible so that if there are delays, then we can still uh, get it up and running by uh, the tight timeline that we do have. So. Okay. Hey, thanks, Director Miller. So just, I, we do have a long queue already. Uh, I see you, Councillor O'Toole. Um, I wanna make sure we get to everybody. So I think what administration's telling us is that uh, they're open to council giving direction um, in terms of site, you know, location of the building on the site. Um, maybe we need to look at this as, as a couple of different motions if we wanna confirm which site concept in terms of the lot layouts, or sorry, the lots. Maybe that's one motion. If we wanted to have some kind of direction to administration on the orientation of the building on the site, then maybe that's another motion, you know, that sort of follows that. 
Um, and then, you know, if, if somebody, you know, feels strongly about parking or making a decision about parking uh, now or council having some role in deciding how much parking, then maybe that's a third motion. Um, and then that, then we've given administration, we sort of set the playing field, you know, funny because what we're talking about, but then we've sort of set the, the constraints that we're providing on the, the project we do that now and then let administration run with it and get it get it out the door that would be my observation if you know um i'm not hearing them say that we can't have input i'm hearing them say that we need to be specific with our input and we should be giving it now um rather than than later on um so i do have a long queue of others that did have questions or comments councillor clayton councillor friesen councillor Thiessen, then councillor o'toole then councillor Manhoss. thanks mary I am definitely. Uh, you've all, Councillor Clayton, you've got your mic open. I'm not sure what the. Oh, what I did not have it open. Yeah. So your individual device has your audio oh, on I, Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah, so I, unless somebody from IT tells me differently, I think if you're in council chambers, use the council chambers yeah. microphone. There we go. Not your good microphone. Yeah, perfect, thanks. Uh, okay, so a couple of observations. I agree with uh, Mayor Given, and, and some of the de uh, decisions are fairly easy. To me, um, as mentioned in the drawings, um, lot three, or sorry, plans, I'm just trying to open it document but the one that we're currently looking at as recommended by administration is my preference of of the actual land um, i agree that uh, the location of the building within that spot could be further to the south um, for, for various reasons uh, in partially some of it um, i don't know if there's been consideration given to shade uh, on the soccer fields that's offset by the building but i do have some concern about this being our final discussion point in regards to the facility. Um, so I just wanted to ask Director Miller again, um, was there any intent to have a discussion with council um, before going to RFP again? Because there are some interior things that um, I think uh, um, after Councillor Plot and I had um, some discussions with various communities last week at uh, the Alberta Parks uh, Recreation and Parks Conference in regards to um, youth drop-in centers and youth activity centers, that there's some observations that um, would be useful in planning the building. So I just want to confirm uh, with Director Miller, your intent was this was to be the final sort of council check-in in regards to the building. Director Miller? Thanks, Mary Given. Uh, so I guess our uh, our intent is for the building itself. We're hoping to uh, get direction today to move forward. On the activity side, I think we uh, the building that we're proposing will accommodate uh, pretty much every activity that we've heard of so far from council. And we did ag agree that we would also do public engagement on activities with council, with the public. So that is yet to come. But um, I think the structure itself, the walls are tall enough to accommodate uh, everything that we've heard from council to date. The surface is a concrete surface, so it'll accommodate the reception side. It'll also accommodate the winter use of uh, the skate park, mobile skate park, parked inside uh, for, for the winter months, if that's what uh, we decide to do. The front end of the building is, uh, it'll be structured in such a way that we'll have an office space, a reception uh, counter, we'll have, uh, it will, It'll be built that if we do have the funds available, we could even have a, a mezzanine, a second floor, but it'll be in addition as part of the RFP. And uh, if the if the budget comes in at the right uh, dollar figure, then we could certainly do that. And uh, you know that's what we're hoping for is to uh, I think we've everything that council has told us today we've made note of, and uh, we've tried to incorporate that into what. Uh, what we're proposing for a building. So it should accommodate almost everything. Okay, and so um, I just wanted to confirm that there will be consideration given for um, lounge type space for youth to, um, you know, potentially visit. Uh, and, and there's many programs that could be run in a sort of uh, youth lounge type space. Uh, and so if, you know, if all those things are considered, we'll come back to discussion for that. Uh, then I would like to, 
um, you know, I agree this is the best location. I don't agree that's necessarily the best location within the site. I do like the conversation of turning it um, 90 degrees. Uh, and, and I also like somebody brought up the, the opportunity of, of having a covered, um, a carport, almost a canopy per se, um, where um, outdoor activities could be uh, protected from snow and rain. Um, and I think that's a very inexpensive addition to the building. Um, so uh, I'll wait for the rest of my colleagues to continue with their comments, but um, definitely I'm prepared to make a couple motions when appropriate. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Councillor Clayton. So next we had uh, Councillor Friesen, then Councillor uh, Thiessen, then O'Toole, then Minhas. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. I'm pleased to see that uh, lot three is the recommendation. Um, I am, as you know, I would have preferred to have seen this entire subdivision um, parcel of land, the, the entire um, space left for housing, um, but I can live with this. My question though is quick, I think. Um, the rezoning, does that, apply to lot three only or are lots one and two affected by that? Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, at this point, if, if we receive sufficient direction for where we're going to locate this uh, center, our intentions are to uh, carve off that area and rezone just that area. What might happen depending on the following discussions, uh, the administration level is uh, drawing that line. If we decide we need just a little bit more room, we'll move it up and, and depending on how far we move that line and once the site plan, plan is finally uh, finalized and whatnot, we might uh, change it in the future. So uh, at this point, we hope to get it right at the first crack and, and just rezone the subject property, leave the remainder as, as high density housing. But as an alternative and just to ensure some flexibility, we might take a little bit more to allow for this project to move ahead and then scale it back in the future with the subsequent rezoning. Um, thanks, yeah, my that the, the intent there is not to kneecap the ideal for this project, but to still reserve as much as possible for uh, housing, because I don't think our housing needs um, demands are going to be going anywhere anytime soon, even, even with what we're working on. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Friesen. Uh, Councillor Thiessen, then Councillor O'Toole, then Councillor Menhaus. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Um, <clears throat> I, just a couple comments quickly. I do like uh, Councillor Platt's idea of perhaps turning the, the centre 90 degrees, uh, and also what Councillor Clayton mentioned on shadowing uh, of the rotary fields. I guess my big question is is largely in regards to the parking requirements. I know we're talking potentially 150 stalls here, uh, but my question is, um, how many stalls do we have um, uh, at the at the East Link Center closest to the pool? I guess that would be on the west side of the site. Uh, to me, that seems like 100 to 150 stalls there. Um, but I think what we're doing essentially for this recreation center, which largely is for low-income people uh, who are in the neighborhood, or at least that was the intention to put it in this area, uh, is that a lot of kids are going to bike, a lot of them are going to walk, uh, some kids are just going to get dropped off, as been mentioned in previous meetings. Um, so I think the need for 150 stalls, although it's kind to the soccer parents and the rotary soccer fields, I don't know if it's necessary. I really agree with Councillor Friesen that we need to try to find a way to make the most of this space. Um, and so I guess uh, 150 stalls for me seems like a bit of overkill. I might be in the line of about 50 stalls uh, if, if it's used and it functions as we think it, as, it as, as we thought originally that it would as a drop-off center. But can administration answer that question for me on the west side of the East Link Center? What are, what's our parking like? Because it looks like we're taking up pretty much all this land for simply pavement and parking. Who from administration could answer that last portion? Director Miller. Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, I don't have that, but uh, we could try to get that as part of the conversation yet today. We can maybe reach out to uh, 
facilities or maybe to Angela Reading at Eastlink. But, um, you know, I can, uh, Stephanie's online, perhaps she could uh, reach out or Mr. Johnson could while we're talking, uh, answering other questions. You know, I think um, Councillor Platt, or Councillor Platt's suggestion to move it, uh, I like that idea. It would allow other activities to be uh, added on. I know there is some discussion or there's some thoughts about a, a skating surface perhaps, uh, maybe even a, a pole type structure over a skating surface with outsides, just uh, some protection. So that would allow us to do that. There has been some discussion in the past about if we, uh, we could maybe mound the snow and have a little toboggan hill for some kids. So, so if we did reduce the parking spaces, we would have uh, more room for that. So we're open to all those suggestions. We, uh, in the past, I know Councillor O'Toole did suggest if we, uh, when we excavate, rather than remove the dirt, we, uh, we mound it and we uh, do a bit of a skate a bike uh, skills park. So we could certainly look at that. You know, we're open to all these suggestions. And if it is, we land on 100 spaces or 90 spaces or 80 spaces for parking, then uh, we're just trying to accommodate ever, I guess, whatever we think we might need in the future. As part of the reception center, you know, if, uh, if we ever needed that, we might uh, have more people parking there. And uh, so, but there's nothing saying they couldn't park on uh, like a gravel or a grassed area as well. So if we had a, a large crowd for some reason. So, so we're open to all the suggestions from council. And we're trying to, uh, it's a rushed project, but we're trying to get it right, certainly. Yeah, so. yeah. thanks, Director Miller. Thanks, Director Miller. Okay, okay. Councillor O'Toole, then Councillor Minhas. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Um, just one question before I start uh, carrying on. Uh, did we incorporate any of the parking on the street as our, our numbers? Because I, I can tell you from previous years, uh, the soccer people would park on the street. Uh, you go there today and there'll be nobody parked on that, on that road other than the people that live there. So this is a pretty wide open stretch on uh, 93rd Street, and I would imagine if there was not a lot of parking, they would park on Park Road. But uh, just throwing that out there. Uh, I've got a, if you're ready for motions, I've got two motions when ready, Mayor Given. Yeah, so I think we've had, uh, Councillor Minhas hasn't had a go yet. Everybody else has had a chance to have a question. So I'd just like to give Councillor Minhas a chance to, to go. And then, uh, yeah, I think it'd be helpful to administration if we started to give some direction. Uh, so that they can put that into the RFP and, and start to move it forward. Um, so, Councilor Tool, if you just want to hold that thought, I can come back. Um, Councilor Minhas. Thank you very much, Mayor well, Given. Um, I think mostly questions and answered things. I like the north and south, but my question on that one is, are we, because we usually get west wind too much, and it's, it would be effect on the, in the winter and summer to be hard to get open the doors and stuff like which we cite. To do that, and 90 degree will be okay. And I'm okay with 150 parking because we always have trouble with the parking. I know I, that road I go through a lot there, and uh, because of that duplex welded on the front, they are always full with the vehicles. And and when the soccer games happen, people park all back there in that whole three lots area. You know, like that. I'm not. Uh, I'm actually very happy we have extra parking. That's always we have a shortage on this. So then even if we have extra parking in the future, if you needed something to be added into. But I like north and south, but I don't know like it's the factor. And then the other question I have, the building gonna be the same structure. It doesn't matter if we go northeast or east, west, the way it is right now. I like, in my opinion, I really like the way it is right now, but we can switch to um, okay, that too. But uh, if we order the steel building, uh, it doesn't matter whether we do north or south, it will not going to affect we can not right way, right? This is the question I got. Director Miller, does the orientation of the building on the site impact the type of construction? Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, not that I'm aware of. We haven't, uh, we haven't engaged in a conversation with any uh, potential builders to date, but uh, it's my understanding that it could be uh, placed however we decide and uh, they'll build it accordingly. Okay. 
Okay, uh, then if we had some motions, and, and I have a feeling we have, may have a few, and that's that's fine. I, uh, so, Councillor Tool, you want to start? Yeah, thank you very much, Baron Given. I move the Council direct administration to proceed with concept three being the lot that Council chooses. Okay, thanks, Councillor Tool. Any uh, discussion or debate on Councillor Tool's motion, which really just uh, gives administration direction on which lot lot layout, not not the layout of the building on the lot necessarily. Uh, Council can have additional discussion about that or any of the other things that we want to do. But everybody's clear that this motion is just on out of those three lot concepts. Uh, Councillor Tool's motion is directing administration to use the third. Everybody's clear with that. Okay. Uh, then, uh, are, is there any discussion or debate on the motion? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? That motion carries unanimously. Okay. Were there any other motions arising? Councillor O'Toole? I thank move, you. sorry, thank you. I move that uh, the location of the building on the site would be uh, perpendicular to the uh, lot two. So. It would be parallel to the 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 uh, the, uh, the the side uh, the lot uh, location uh, to lot two, so it would be north and south. Sure. So, Council two, I think that's parallel to lot. Parallel. Two. Yeah. Parallel. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's so early in the morning, Mayor Given. Yeah, I hear it. Okay. So parallel to lot two. Um, so essentially, uh, your intent is to rotate the building 90 degrees. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, any discussion or debate on that motion? Okay, a little bit. I see Councillor Blackburn, then Councillor Clayton, Plot, and Bressy. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mary Gavin. Just a question for clarification. Are we talking about having the, um, the building um, adjacent to 93rd or adjacent to uh, of the Lot 2 boundary? Lot 2 boundary. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Councillor Clayton. Mayor Given, um, a question for Director Miller, probably, uh, in regards to the location of the building, uh, in consideration for the potential use when needed as a, um, a facility for uh, emergency situations, uh, will there be consideration given to the need for hookups for things such as shower camps, et cetera. And the only reason I ask is um, if the facility had exterior hookups for things such as shower camps when it was being used as an emergency facility, would the location of the lot, uh, of the building rather, need to be a little more centered um, to access the hookups? And, and so a little more explanation, if it was to run parallel to lot two, um, if the hookups were intended to be on the back side, does it? Um, will there? Will you just adjust accordingly? I don't really want to get into the exact per square inch of where this building is, but I'm just wondering um, what the intent was. Um, you know, with the actual location, will there be enough perimeter if we needed to put shower camps, etc., on uh, to the facility uh, to save some costs and not have a full um, slew of showers inside? Uh, then the building, you know, potentially would need to be a little more centered on the lot, still running parallel with lot two. Um, and I'm just curious uh, what sort of consideration has been given for that. Yeah. Director Miller. Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, that's, uh, that's good feedback for us, uh, Councillor Clayton. We uh, we did talk about having outside uh, hose bibs or water taps, so we'll, uh, so we'll have the hookups. I think uh, we'll make notes or we'll have a further discussion to make sure they would be adequate. But I think the placement of the building as described by Councillor O'Toole would allow us, uh, we'll figure out how we could have a, a camp, shower camp type setup. In discussions with AHS, uh, you know, we're gonna meet the requirements to have enough showers inside to, to be a reception center if we ever do need it. We have many other facilities in the city that we can use as well depending on what uh, the requirement is. But we could, we looked at hooking up a shower camp at other facilities too, and it's it's a costly uh, venture to do that. And it's frequent pumping out uh, of the, the catchment uh, tanks, I guess. We also talked about, uh, we'll have a generator ready. So if, if we lose power in the community, we can hook up uh, 
a generator to the site. We won't put a generator in because that's too expensive, but uh, it'll be ready for that. So all this is good feedback for us to be uh, prepared for whatever the future brings. So thank you for that. Okay. Thanks, Councillor, or thanks, Director Miller. Councillor Clayton, did you get the yeah, information sure. you wanted? Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I support the location, and I can talk with Director Miller um, after this regarding some other considerations. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, some folks turned off their screens, so they've jumped around, and I kind of lost my uh, my rotation. I know that I had uh, Councilor Bressy was in there. Councilor Thiessen, were you also in the queue? No. Okay. Councilor. Okay. Councilor Bressy. Councilor Plot. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. I think uh, one concern is I think for looking at just the activity center, that probably is a better alignment for it. But my concern is. It's a small one, but my concern is we don't know what we're doing with the rest of the land. And all of a sudden, if the activity center is at that orientation, it's really hard to access the rest of Lot 3, whether that's for supplementary parking to whatever else goes there or building into there where it just seems like it's a more flexible space in its current alignment. So that's one thing to consider. Um, that being said, if Council wants it parallel to Lot 2, I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea, but I'm really concerned about giving specific and concrete mm -hmm. direction to administration right now. So I'd hate to see them put in the position of, as Mr. Miller said, it's not, it seems like a good idea to him, and at first blush, it seems doable, but as they actually get into this, who knows what's going to pop up, and there could be a reason that they discover that that doesn't that that doesn't work anymore. I'd hate to have them have to go through the process of coming back to council and asking for us to change our direction and wondering, do we do something better that's going to even compress our timeline further or not? So I really think that we made a decision as a council to use funding that is very time constrained. And when we made that decision, we knew that there were limits on that. And I think one of the limits that puts on us is we don't get as much as much formal say as we would have had if we had unlimited time because we had chosen to use our own money. And so for me, I think I'm at the point of I'm very comfortable with council giving advice to administration, and I really hope that they do involve us and they do talk to us about what are our thoughts. But I also think that we, we're at a point where we need to let administration go and actually make the decisions if we're going to get this done in the timelines that we chose to be stuck with. And so I'm not going to support this motion, even though I'm not necessarily against the idea. I think I'd rather council be giving advice to administration on this, not direction to administration on this. Okay, thanks, Councilor Bressy. Councilor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. I guess I'm I'm curious on how we're consulting the community without a proper site plan. Um, if we're talking like we're going to treat this like an actual development, um, I would expect, and I'm I'm not knocking administration on this because we're we're trying to rush through this. I guess, but I guess for me, it's hard to approve any plan. I don't know where the access to the lot is. I don't know where the parking is going to go. I don't know where the building is going to go. So if we're going to go and consult with the community, I'm pretty confident those are questions they're going to ask. So again, I'm going to come back to, um, I don't think we need to make this decision today. I think if we made this decision by December 1st with a proper site plan, it gives us more than enough time to go out. I'm not trying to put extra work on procurement here by any means. The building can still go get procured. Servicing is the only difference of whether the lot or how it is. The building is the building. Um, I just, I think the reason we're going to go around and around on this is that we don't actually have a site plan. We have a big, big track of land, 100 or 150 stalls and a building sitting on it. And it's really hard, even for somebody that does this kind of stuff, it's really hard to visualize how this could lay out on a site without that information on there. I'm just wondering if there's any way administration could actually give us a, a, a site plan because I'm assuming we're going to need a proper site plan to take this to the community and do a proper development. So administration speak to a, a site plan, specifically of where trees would go, where, where parking lot would go all that, because if we're going to actually go to procurement, I would assume we would need that sort of detail. Um, Director Miller. Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, so we, we haven't uh, got to the point of having an actual site plan yet. Uh, CLT had a bit of a discussion about this last week, and we thought it would be important to get feedback from Council today. To, uh, as to the placement of the building. The other thing we have in the works is we, uh, we did the Alberta One call for this location and we have uh, a company on, well, we're hoping to call them today to say go ahead and do the, the geotech testing. It takes about a month to get the results from that. We want to have those results ready for the RFP as well so that uh, any potential bidders know what the ground is like, which could uh, have an impact on what type of structure goes on the ground as well. So. Uh, you know, I, 
I don't know what else to really add, but we, I, if, if, that's, if that's council's direction to bring it back, then uh, that'll put us a little bit behind the eight ball, I think, because uh, Christmas season is in there as well. And in talking to procurement, she doesn't think it's fair that, uh, she doesn't think we'll get the response that we need if we go during the Christmas period for the RFP. So it's either do it before Christmas and allow the submissions to be sent to us before, or we have to wait until after Christmas would be her recommendation. So we're really hopeful to get it out before and then uh, make a decision, give the contractor who it's, who it's awarded to, give them time to do the design, order supplies, and then we're hopeful actually they could uh, maybe get into the ground as early as uh, February. So, Just, uh, I guess I'm wondering what we're procuring if we don't have a site plan. And, and that's, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to that again. I guess without a proper site plan, I don't know what we're procuring. If we're saying building, sure, 100 stalls, whatever it is, but... I don't know what we're procuring without a site plan. I don't know how a underground contractor, a road company, a dirt company could even do a, an RFP on that site without a proper site plan. So for me, I'm struggling without a site plan to, to, to have the conversation, to be honest a little bit. I, I think we're, we're gonna go round and around on it. I, and I love that we're trying to give administration direction on some thoughts, but it, it's, it's hard to work on a blank slate for me without some, other than a box, we don't know what else is going on this lot right now. So I'm just, I'm struggling with that a lot, to be honest. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Uh, I think I had Councillor Clayton in the queue next. I see you, uh, City Manager Glante. Uh, you know, and I'll just enter though to say that I, I think we are all going to be facing uh, the uncertainty in this project is is pretty high. And I think Councillor Plot, you're you're feeling that, and and it is, you know, it, it doesn't have the. It, I see you didn't really like that sort of response. Um, by the way, you're leaning back in your chair, um, but uh, there is a lot of uncertainty that isn't known right now, and uh, we can either give administration a whole bunch of direction and, and guide that process as we traditionally would. Um, we can try to uh, suggest that they should be able to do different timelines than they're telling us, and we can see how that works out. Or we can say, we wanted this building, we wanted to pay for it this way, we wanted it on this site, and we're getting all that. Um, and maybe we need to recognize, maybe we need to recognize when we won and let administration move the ball and actually get this thing built so it can be opened. Um, City Manager Galante, and then uh, yeah. Councillor Clayton. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just as a, a general comment, um, and I will draw an analogy with uh, the development of downtown. Um, Council will need to think about your level of comfort in, in what level of details um, you prefer to provide direction to administration and which level of detail is left to administration to decide. Um, as some of you may recall, on some of the phases of downtown, the initial phases, um, there was a lot of involvement in terms of uh, details. For example, selection of ornamental, uh, ornamental lights, uh, the type of benches, the type of pavers for parking lanes. So, in this case, creating an analogy, um, if the desire of council is to be more involved in, in those details, that is, that is totally fine. It's just as more, it's gonna consume more time. So for example, you know, the design of the site plan, um, all the landscaping, uh, trees location, uh, also the interior of the building, for example, location of the bathrooms and you know, other features. So, um, Unfortunately, because of the timelines we're dealing with in this particular project, um, I'm not sure if we have enough time to, to go, work together on, on that. So perhaps just a general direction to administration, and then um, if you feel comfortable with that, then we will have to take some decisions um, in order to proceed. Um, otherwise, you know, the, the whole process will be delayed, and, and we're concerned about completion time. So just think about that level of comfort to, to, to what level, um, you know, there's involvement from council or um, just administration to uh, to proceed. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Manager Galante. Uh, Ms. Casale, I saw you come on. Uh, I have a feeling you have some information that'll be helpful to us. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, through the chair, we were able to um, identify the number of parking stalls at the uh, CKC campus. So on the west uh, parking lot, there are 174 um, standard stalls and nine disabled stalls. 
Great. Uh, question asked and uh, answer provided. Thanks very much, Mr. Casale. Uh, okay, and so uh, folks bounced around a little bit, I think. So we still have Council Tools motion on the floor uh, with respect to orientation of the building on the site uh, with that 90 degree rotation. Uh, Councillor Clayton, I saw your hand. Uh, Councillor Thiessen, are you in the queue? And then we'll come back to Councillor Plot again. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, Mayor Given, mine was for a subsequent motion. I'm good now. Thank you. Okay. okay. Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I really appreciated what you had to say about uh, taking wins and uh, having a bit of confidence in our administration that um, if we want to move this forward and move it forward quickly, I know we have our, our typical standard ways of doing things, but um, I think we just need to break it down to the nuts and bolts of, of what we want and uh, get out of the way of administration in regards to this one. I don't think they're going to set us up for failure. Uh, I think, in fact, you know, we may want to detail the project so much or do things the way we normally do things that we may bog it down and uh, thereby impact, uh, you know, the next council's budget and or, um, you know, just uh, not get it completed in time. And that's... Uh, you know, we, this is already a risky project as it is. Um, I do like the north-south location, as the motion is, is stated uh, by Councillor O'Toole. I do think there are constraints in the site, but I do think uh, they're workable constraints. And if we can figure out, A, how many parking stalls we need, uh, and B, if we can just settle on how where, where this building is going to be situated, I think we're going to be doing ourselves in administration and procurement a, a huge favor as far as getting this done and getting it done in the timeline that we wish. So no questions, but thank you. Just wanted to comment on it. Okay, okay. thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Councillor Blackburn, uh, then Councillor Councillor Plot. Were you still in? I thought I saw you sort of wave off there. Not in. Okay. Uh, so Councillor Blackburn, then Councillor Mithas. Thank you, Mary Gavin. Um, most of what I was about to express was uh, expressed by Councillor Thiessen. So thank you, Chris, for that. Um, I guess what comes out of it for me is that. Uh, Indeed, there is a lot of risk in terms of getting this done in time to be able to uh, be uh, to have it paid for in part by uh, by provincial government. And so, <clears throat> I would suggest that administration has already heard some of our ideas regarding the location of the building, the orientation of it, the parking, etc. And I would suggest that we just stand back and get out of their way. And uh, and because of that, I'm not going to support the motion. Okay, thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Menhaus. Thank you, well, Mayor Given. Um, I think you did very good, you know, that we should have the confidence on the administration. Actually, myself, I like the way it is right now, but I'll support North West because when I see the North West going, we be asking too much room on the front. And like we said, you know, we don't have a plan for this site, so we need consulting. I'm not Quite agree. If you're going to move ahead, we should do the building and get get over and start it. And otherwise, like you said, we're going to be delay and we're going to not get this project going ahead in on time, or we're going to lose that money. So that's my couple comments. Just a couple cents in there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Minhas. So, any uh, other comments on Councillor O'Toole's motion? Seeing none, Councillor O'Toole, do you want a chance to close? Uh, you're just, we don't uh, have audio from your Councillor O'Toole. No, definitely not. Give it, give it a shot there. No, nothing. That, uh, I can see that your mute is on and now your mute's off, uh, but we're not getting any audio from however you're connected there. Mayor Kevin, can I maybe ask a question of clarification with administration just while we're waiting for Councillor O'Toole? Sure. To... Yeah, Councillor yeah, Council O'Toole, do your thing uh, if you're going to try to reconnect or whatever you want to do there. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Russi. Great. So just a question of clarification for administration. Uh, my intent is to vote against this motion, even though I think there might be merit to align it there. I just want to clarify with administration that if this motion fails, is administration going to take absence of direction as direction to leave this building where it is? Or would it, if this motion fails, would administration take that as we've got freedom to put it where where it makes sense? So I just want to clarify with administration that by defeating a motion, not having a motion, that doesn't stick the building where it is in this concept that's shown to us right now. Director Miller? 
Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. I think um, the motion, the way it uh, reads right now, is I think it's my personal view. I I like what was suggested by Councillor Platt, and I, I like the motion. I think it does make more sense to turn it that way. We've been told in the past that uh, the soccer folks, uh, they park along uh, the shaded area, that light area. So if we did uh, move it 90 degrees, it would still allow, and if we made a parking spaces there, they could actually sit in their vehicles, watch the soccer during uh, when the weather isn't as great either. So, uh, so it does provide more options. So if the motion is lost, uh, we'll still decide uh, the best uh, orientation, but it may be what was suggested. I think that does make more sense. Uh, it allows more options for uh, development in the future. Yeah, so, so just to be clear, Director Miller, um, with Council Bresky's question, so if this motion was defeated, because the motion is specific to moving it that way, administration will still see this as an option that's available to them. They're not gonna exclude this just because Council didn't vote for this motion. That's correct. We'd have further discussion with uh, other uh, departments to, to make sure it does make sense to do it that way. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so, Councillor, did I see Councillor O'Toole pop back on? I thought I did for a second. There you go. There you go. Okay, Mayor Given, uh, the reason I'd like it rotated to 90 degrees uh, parallel to lot two is the fact that we get westerly winds and that would block wind. So, if there was any uh, activity that's coming in and in front of the building, then that would be a natural wind block. Uh, there may be uh, a, a spot for a pond that we could uh, skate on, and that would be great. So, uh, so that's my reasoning, and uh, I just think that this would be the uh, most uh, uh, effective location, parallel. It'd give us more opportunities to have outside things during the summer as well as in the winter time. Uh, saying that, uh, I think administration has heard from us many, many times. Uh, when I presented originally, we said that this would be a risk. We chose to use this location. Uh, and I think, and, I, and actually I don't think anymore, I know for a fact that administration knows that this is a desire of council and they are going to make sure that we get all the bells and whistles that we asked for uh, in, in, the present, in the presentation. And Arlen Miller already this morning said that he heard us many times and uh, this would be the great location for this in this lot. We've already agreed that that's gonna take place. Now, the fine details of it's gonna be a little bit more to the north or a little bit more to the south, I don't care at this point in time. We should be happy that we're getting the building built where it needs to be and where it needs to be located is there's a little bit of variable there. So I urge you all to vote uh, in favor of this and so we can get things going so we have this money to spend Otherwise, we're gonna be in a bit of a pickle. Uh, it's been said by Mayor Given, and uh, I agree with Mayor Given. Uh, this was a risk to begin with. And anytime we delay anything like this, uh, do we need the access to the road? It could be off 93rd, it could be off Park Road. We don't know yet, but you know what? It's just a curb and gutter thing that we need to cut the, the asphalt and put the road into the parking lot. That's a little tiny thing. And we're getting to a point where we're trying to put things into this plan so we can come up with a site plan. That's all I got to say. Please vote for this uh, motion, please. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor O'Toole. Uh, so that was the close on Councillor O'Toole's motion, which was to give administration specific uh, direction to rotate the building 90 degrees. Uh, I'm thinking that is north-south, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's on an angle, so it's hard to quite, kind of tell. Yeah. Um, but I think we all know the intent to rotate the building 90 degrees from where it is. Um, so I'll call for the vote on Councillor O'Toole's motion. All those in favor? Okay, I see one, two, three, three and four in favor and oppose. I see one, two, three, four. Am I missing somebody? Who am I missing? You. Oh. I'm up. Yeah, Councillor Clayton. Sorry, I. Sorry, Councillor or uh, Mayor Given, I was in favor. You missed me on the first count. Didn't I? So I had. Okay, so let me. Sorry, let me do that again. All those in favor? I'll just say it out. Okay, I see Councillor Plot, Councillor Thiessen, Councillor Minhas, Councillor O'Toole, Councillor Clayton. Thank you. That's five. And opposed. There we go. And that's four opposed. Myself, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Blackburn, and Councillor Bressy. Okay, thanks everybody, sorry about that. Councillor Plot. 
Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. I guess we're still continuing to try to give some direction here. I would make a motion that we have this site available with 100 parking stalls. I know it's probably a little higher than some people have an appetite here for and a little bit lower than what administration is recommending. Um, I think 100 is a good number to, for us to be able to keep a lot of green space on the site. Um, and I'm thinking the administration would like some direction on a specific amount of stalls. So I think 100 is uh, a lot for the area and maybe maybe a bit of an overkill, but I do think that that, land, that, that parking space could be used for other things and activities. Um, ball hockey, different things. We could be putting our skate park, those kind of things on it. And so... I think 100 is a safe number that we'll be okay with and, and not necessarily overbuilding it. Um, and to do that, I'm, I'm hoping that we're, we're reducing the amount of money that we're paving and putting in paving so that if we do go over a little bit on our costs, we're not putting it in a parking lot, we're putting it into the actual structure. Um, if in time that we feel that we need more parking, that's a future council decision that we can add capital money to add more parking in later. So I'm hoping that we can look at 100 stalls. Okay, thanks very much. That motion's uh, specific. Uh, direct administration to include uh, 100 parking stalls with the, the, the development. Um, Councillor Clayton, Bressy, Friesen. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Yeah, I would support this motion. As mentioned by Councillor Plott, um, if the parking stalls aren't used, uh, asphalt's relatively inexpensive compared to concrete, and I think that it would provide a playing surface, uh, as mentioned, ball hockey, maybe we put up a basketball hoop, uh, different things like that. So I think that uh, 100 stalls is a, is a good compromise. Uh, it, it allows for recreation space as well as adequate parking. So I will support this. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bressy, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Thiessen, Councillor Blackburn. Great. Th thank you. Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. I think uh, I was the one that originally flagged parking and as a activity center, 150 stalls is way too much. That being said, I appreciate the reminder that this is also a reception center. And if this is an area where we're receiving, uh, I know a couple hundred people wouldn't sleep there, but I could see this being used by G Prep as a registration center, in which case you could have a couple hundred cars coming through it in a short amount of time. Or if it is a reception center, it's great that we've got beds and showers in there, but what about... Salvation Army being able to set up their food tr their food truck to give evacuees food considerations like that. I don't. I think that 150 stalls is probably more than we even need for a reception center. But it's not as re it's not ridiculously overblown for a reception center in my in my mind. So I don't have nearly as big a red flag realizing this reception re being reminded to reception center too. Uh, I'd still hope that administration would reconsider the parking and think: Do we really really need 150 stalls here? But like I said the last time, even if I feel that it should probably be less stalls, I think we're at a we're at a point in time where because of the funding we chose, we need to give administration latitude to make these decisions. So I tend to agree that 100 probably is right, but I also think that this should be an administration decision right now because I don't want them to have to come back to us if talking to GPREP and talk to other community partners, they realize, no, actually, we really do think we need 150 stalls. So I'll be voting no to this motion. I hope it fails. That being said, I hope that administration, if it does fail, will still have some really hard conversations and some good conversations amongst itself about how many stalls are really needed. Okay, thanks, Councilor Bressy, Councilor Friesen, Councilor Thiessen, Councilor Blackburn. Thanks, Mayor Given. <clears throat> uh, I'm with Councilor Bressy. I think that uh, probably less parking will be just fine. Um, but my, my position on the last motion, the orientation of the building, it is the same as this. Let's give direction and considerations to administration. And I know that they hear us. And um, as Director Miller said, he all, you know, he, he heard and agreed with the previous um, direction, whether the motion passed or not. And I would trust that that's happening with, uh, with this motion as well. So uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of being prescriptive to this level of detail. So I won't. Uh, vote in favor of this motion, but the spirit and the intent I do appreciate and I trust that administration has heard and will um, will keep this in mind. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thiessen and Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, first, I have to apologize because I did arrive late to this meeting. Uh, quick question. The gray area that's represented in this map, that reflects parking? Like as 150 stalls? No. Uh, okay, um, I guess... Um, Sorry, Director Miller, go ahead. A bunch of us were shaking our head, but that's not the same yeah. answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Director Miller? Yeah, thanks, Mayor Gillen. So, uh, 
yeah, the gray area would be uh, where we'd put parking. We don't know exactly how 150 or 100 would fit, but uh, that was the intent. Okay, no, thank you for that. Now, I'm still thinking about the East Link Center. I appreciate the 174. Thank you, uh, Ms. Casule. Um, now, that's a pretty big uh, chunk of asphalt and concrete. Um, so I'm going to make a motion to amend uh, uh, Councillor Platt's motion of 100 stalls. Uh, and I'm just going to half it uh, from the original, which was 150, but I'm going to amend to include only 75 stalls. Now, speaking to this motion, um, just not too far up the road at Mother Teresa School, uh, it's a community gym. We have a part of our scores agreement. Uh, they have regular events happening there, dodgeball. Uh, we've done DI in the gym, stuff like that. They only have 60 stalls at Mother Teresa School. And uh, I've never seen after, after school hours um, it overwhelmed with parking based off of the usage. Now, I know we're talking about a bit of a bigger space than a, than a double gym, but uh, still for me, uh, I think this level of parking is a bit overkill. When I look at the site design and now that the building is potentially as directed by council being turned to the, you know, then it's 90 degree orientation. I think there's a way that we can actually like divide this lot in half and then develop the other half of the lot. If we start encroaching with parking lot and I understand there's some good ideas like with basketball hoops and stuff. The last thing I want to get into though is, um, you know, turning uh, a parking lot space into a recreation space. I, I think uh, we need to keep parking as parking, uh, and I don't want to make that extra that extra room for it. I think 75 is a perfectly appropriate number. It may even be too much as it stands right now, um, but in regards to the 100 stalls, I just think that's too much. I think that's too much asphalt. I think that's too much space on the site that we're going to be taking up, and uh, I want to ensure that uh, this parcel of land is developable either for like a bike skills park with the extra dirt, uh, or housing or other ideas that we've talked and I just don't want to see it go down into, uh, into you know, parking asphalt. So uh, for all those reasons, uh, I, I move to amend the motion to only represent 75 stalls for parking. Thank you. Okay, certainly you ha have the right to make a motion to amend uh, and that's uh, specific and in order. Um, uh, so we can have a discussion and debate on Councillor Thiessen's motion to amend down to 75. Um, I'll just enter to say that I uh, won't support the motion to amend and I won't support the main motion uh, for the reasons that some of the other council members have described. I think this is getting overly specific. Um, I think administration is hearing the nature of the conversation that council doesn't want to waste a lot of the site on parking. I think administration will take that into consideration as they design, uh, but they will also have some other design constraints that, that we might not be aware of right now. Um, and I think either case of 100 or 75 or 150, um, I think if, if our desire is to say, try not to use up the whole space on, on parking, um, fair enough. Um, but getting into specific numbers, I'm not willing to support any of those motions. Um, and uh, I, as a chair, I'll help make sure that everybody gets the motions on the floor that they want to. Um, but I think the first motion that we made was the only one that we really, we really needed to. Um, so I, I don't feel the need to support any of the others. Um, but on Councillor Thiessen's amendment to 75, I think I had Councillor Minhas uh, and then Councillor Palat. Thank you, Mayor Belgevin. I think you said it all, what I was going to say, but I, I can't support these both motions on this. I'm okay with 150. We can even leave it the gravel. We have to leave it, but uh, the administration is recommended and they know a lot of stuff. What goes on, we don't a lot of time. Yes, it needs the public consideration, but we've got to do it. I'm not supporting this to both motions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, who did I have after Councilor Minhas? Councilor Plot. Sorry. No, no worries. Thanks, Mayor Given. Um, I actually really like this motion, and, and I want Council to remind, I, I know we're saying, hey, we want to stay out of administration's way. This actually gives administration direction, and 75 gives them direction. And also, I want to remind you guys, if we just say, hey, go ahead and do 150, and they do that, and those 75 stalls never get used, that's a whole bunch of money and capital we put into a building that we didn't need to. It might be the difference of us putting mezzanine space in there for future offices so we can start having tutoring programs and not-for-profits agencies. We're going to take funding away from the entire building. 
to put it in a parking lot, which we probably don't need. And so I really hope, you know, I was fine with 100. I think 75 is even fine. Um, there is already parking on site, as been alluded by a couple of council members. So I know that as director, as Mayor Given and people have said, hey, let's just get out of their way. At the same time that we're here for a reason today, we're here to give them some direction. And I think this gives them very good direction. And it also safeguards us to not spend a whole bunch of money on something we may never, ever, ever need. If we need later on to put more paving in, we can always put more paving in. But off the start, if this is a difference of us not being able to afford to put a mezzanine, to have an agency in there to help after school programs and different things, that is not a decision. I We won't know that for time. But what we do know is if we go ahead and put 150 stalls on there, we probably just allocate another three or $400,000 to paving and light fixtures and curbing and those various things. So I really hope you guys support 75. It's enough parking to make that site work. And to Councillor Thiessen's point, we're also going to stagnate a piece of land. If we get to where we put a whole bunch of parking stalls on there and do all these things, and administration's here for direction, which I'm loving that they're giving us this opportunity to speak. So let's take advantage of it. We could potentially have another site that we could work with Grand Spirit if this is laid out right, instead of having a parking lot that we may never use and capital money that we may never use, operational costs of snow plowing, all the maintenance on it, the capital cost replacing something we never needed. Let's just start with 75 stalls. I'll be shocked if we ever see 50 stalls actually used in this space. And that one-off chance that Councillor Bressy said, hey, if this ever becomes a reception center, if it's full for reception emergency purposes, a one-off in a calendar every five years, so be it. If it means that we're jam-packed in there because there's an emergency in our community that we need to use this, great. Let's not overbuild it and overdesign it for that hypothetical just in case we need the space. Um, so I'm really urging us to support Councillor Thiessen's motion. I think it's a great motion. Okay, thanks Councillor Plott. Uh, any other discussion or debate? I see Councillor Bressy. Great, uh, just a question actually for our recording secretary and then just a question for Councillors Thiessen and Plott if this matches their intention. But is this motion being, is, is the motion that we've got on the table right now being prescriptive saying if this amendment passes and then the motion passes that administration shall build either 75 or 100 stalls or is it they may build up to 75 or 100 100 stalls where I'm, I'm asking are we given an upper limit to how many stalls can be on here or are we given a very prescriptive it will be 75 stalls or it will be 100 stalls so first for the recording secretary what's being captured well uh arlene can absolutely answer i think we should ask, actually ask the mover um, if uh, if they had an intent in their motion. Sure, yeah, so, and that was going to be my next question. I just, so sure, whoever you want to ask, I just want to know what what was intended and what we're voting on. Yeah, Councillor Thiessen? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Given. Thanks for that uh, question of clarity, Councillor Bressy. Um, for me, uh, at, just to sort of reiterate what Councillor Platt said, I'd be very surprised if uh, we'd ever hit 50 stalls on that site based off of uh, the intended usage as a drop-in center. Um, uh, so I would say up to 75 stalls um, uh, is is what would be the intended motion. I think that gives the administration lots of latitude when they turn the building and then they can look at the site yeah. and how many so they can So the intent was to include the words up to? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Good, so we've got that clarity. Okay. Uh, Director Miller, did you have something? Uh, yes, just a little piece of additional information Mayor given. Uh, so Councillor, or sorry, Director uh, uh, Manuel, advised that uh, the parking lot east of Revolution Place uh, behind Wendy's is 87 parking spaces, just to put it in perspective. But uh, I think uh, we want to make sure we have adequate parking, but uh, at the same time, we know if it's grassed area beyond the pavement, they can also park on the, the grassed area, unless we had uh, other structures there. But uh, the other thought, we, we did have a bit of a conversation with administration that if uh, on some of the paved area, we may put the mobile skate park as we rotate it around the commun community. So, so if we had adequate, adequate space, we could go there for maybe a, a weekend or two during the summer and, uh, and then still have adequate parking. Okay, okay. thanks, uh, Director Miller. Uh, so we still have uh, Councillor Thiessen's amendment on the floor. Was anybody else to speak to the amendment? Uh, sorry, it doesn't look like I see anybody else to speak to the amendment. Then uh, we'll call for the vote on Council of Easton's amendment uh, to direct administration to provide up to 75 parking stalls. All those in favor? 
I see Councillor Plott, Councillor Thiessen, Councillor Clayton, and Councillor O'Toole. I think on my map that adds up to one, two, three, four. <laughs> All those opposed? That is Councillor Friesen, myself, Councillor Blackburn, Councillor Minhaus, and Councillor Bressy. That's five opposed. The motion does not carry. The amendment does not carry, I should say. So we're back onto the main motion as originally uh, made. Uh, directing administration to provide, and I, I'll, I'll add this, and I'll just look to Councillor Pilot who made it. I think it, we, the intent was up to. Is that correct? Yeah, that's so correct. We get that little bit on there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So of up to 100 parking stalls. Any need for additional discussion or debate on Councillor Plot's motion? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote. All those in favor? I see Councillor Pilot. Councillor Clayton and Councillor O'Toole in favor, uh, and those opposed. And I see myself, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Blackburn, Councillor Minhas, Councillor Bressy, and Councillor Thiessen opposed. So that motion does not carry. Um, so administration has latitude to provide uh, the parking space that's required, um, and administration has heard some of the concerns uh, from council about site utilization and cost. So I would expect that they would take those into consideration. Does anybody feel a need to put forward any other motions on uh, on this topic today for our meeting before we get into committees? Seeing none, then if that's the case, then uh, we will adjourn our special city council meeting. Um, and I think we're just staying on this uh, Zoom link to move into committees. Is that correct, Director Bork? Uh, that's correct, Mayor Given. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I will uh, close out. Uh, our special city council meeting is concluded and we'll move over to our first committee meeting. Uh, and are we starting with community services? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, uh, and so I think that's community services and Councillor Blackburn. Except we don't have your audio, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mary David. Um, first off, uh, thank you to you for appointing me to this position. I'm looking forward to working with uh, Director Miller and his staff. And uh, also a thank you to Councillor Friesen for her work on this committee in the past. Um, so welcome to the community services meeting uh, for what's today, October 27th. And um, we'll start with the, uh, with the director's report. Uh, uh, Director Miller, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Blackburn. So I'll start off with uh, CKC and Aquatics. Uh, so the first week of the public uh, splash and play was very well attended. The first night was at 100% capacity in both time slots. The second offering was uh, at the time of this report last week, it was 85% full already. And uh, pool rentals are still doing well. And then the, the squash club will begin rentals the first week of November. Pickleball has started their cohort time slot. And uh, the synchro club is also booking uh, on a regular basis now. Uh, effective October 22nd, all players, uh, team staff, volunteers, and spectators are required to wear face coverings, just non-medical masks in all rec facilities that are hosting a Grand Prairie Minor Hockey, Peace Country Female Athletics Club, or Grand Prairie Athletics Club events. That was a requirement they put in place, and it's uh, required entry in the facility and, and also in the public gathering areas, which we know things have now changed with our, our bylaw in effect as well with our, our numbers that we have had. Uh, and then switching to events and entertainment uh, with Revolution Place. Just a quick note on the Grand Perry 26th uh, annual women's show. It was very successful, over 2,500 guests and vendors in attendance, and uh, everybody was really respectful of uh, the AHS requirements for uh, masking and uh, distancing. Uh, with the Bose Event Centre, the South Peace Volleyball Club has booked the Bose from December to May. They're installing a, a removable court over the floor and they'll remove it as necessary for other bookings in the venue. So that's good news. And the Celtic Academy is also using the Bose for daytime sports programming. Oh. 
Oh, sorry, I thought uh, somebody else was talking. And then uh, also uh, the Drag Queen Bingo will be held on November 13th and 14th with three different events. And Saturday night is already sold out, so that's good news. Switching to facilities, uh, the Curling Club, and uh, this was in the media recently, so we appreciate uh, the feedback from the Curling Club, but the new ultra-low charge ice plant has arrived on site and has been installed should be commissioned on November 2nd, which should give adequate time to build ice so that their season can start. I believe it's November 16th. And uh, they have adequate teams to start the season and to, to do a season, so that's really good news. And with the East Link, uh, they're currently reviewing the, the chlorination system that council approved for us to install, and then uh, just determining next steps to go forward with that. And then at the library facilities is also assisting with minor renovations and upgrades to the young adults area. And then with fleet, just a conversion of the equipment for winter use uh, is ongoing. For sports development, wellness and culture, they're welcoming a new tenant to Muscosipi Park. This tenant will provide food and beverage service to the guests to the Ernie Radburn Pavilion. And uh, it's anticipated to open up in November. And uh, pavilion enhancements that were approved by council as well. So it's painting of the pavilion and a few other touch-ups. Uh, it's scheduled for completion by the end of October. So it'll be a fresh look down there. And then uh, with transit, they recently held discussions with the GPRC staff regarding the nursing program and the potential uh, transit connection between the college and the, the new hospital site. And that should be in place for September of uh, 2021. And then our, just some update on our ridership numbers, the conventional fixed routes are at about 50% of uh, what they have been in the past. And we're similar to other communities in the province similar size and uh, the larger ones as well. And then accessible ridership continues to be at about uh, between 20 and 24% level. It uh, varies between days. So that's my report, uh, Mr. Chair, unless there's any questions. Thank you, Director Miller. Are there questions? Uh, Councillor Clayton and then Councillor Bresci. Thank you, Chair Blackburn. Um, Director Miller, could you, I, I know that there had been uh, informal discussions in regards to winter activities in neighborhoods, and I think it's called the Winter Blast. I'm wondering um, if you can provide an update sort of overview here. Maybe you could send out an email to Council. I'm just, I was looking for more information and, and wondered when the program will start and when the public will start to hear about it as, as we head into the winter season and potentially neighborhoods start to plan things in their, in their area. Yeah, uh, thank you very, uh, through the chair, thank you very much for the question. And I see we have Katie who's uh, on the screen. She can answer that for us, please. Uh, good morning, thank you, Chair Blackburn. So we have just began the preliminary discussions around winter blast. Um, as many of council knows, it started in 2016 with hometown hockey, and we've had about 10 to 12 neighborhoods participating in the past. Um, we are working on a toolkit that includes things like activities that can be done um, while adhering to COVID guidelines, some event graphics, some poster templates, and we are working with some other departments uh, such as transportation and the fire department to see um, what we can incorporate into the toolkit as far as barricading roads, having fire pits, bringing barbecues out, things like that. Um, typically, it's been held on family day. However, there is a large event at East Link Centre on family day, so we want to ensure we have appropriate resources in place, and we're looking at dates in March to potentially accommodate the event. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Clayton, you had something else? Yes, yeah, thanks, Chair Blackburn. Um, either for Ms. Bieberdorf or for, for Director Miller, I wondered if there'd be any consideration um, for getting the resources and toolkit, as it was called, available earlier. I, I appreciate that March is definitely still winter in our area, but uh, um, the goal, in my opinion, is to get as many people outside um, as often as possible throughout the entire winter. So. If at all possible, and it, it, without it being cost prohibitive, if there was an opportunity to um, start this promotion of outdoor winter activities sooner than later, I think that would be um, a great initiative on behalf of the city for our community. And so um, I'm curious if it could potentially start even sooner. Uh, Councilor, Director Miller or um, Ms. Bieberdorf. 
Great. Thank you. Um, we have been working with the marketing department. It's about a six-week turnaround time to get graphics and different things like that. So we certainly are, um, we have started the process, so we should be able to get some materials out uh, hopefully before Christmas and then promote the actual event to occur in March. Perfect. Thank you. So if I can, um, Councillor Blackburn, just one follow-up. Um, so although the actual event, as you know, as you described, will be uh, following Family Day, there still will be an opportunity or information available for neighborhoods and families uh, and communities that want to do winter activities in their area. The, that information will be available earlier, as you said, in December, potentially. Thank you, Chair Blackburn. That's correct. We are going to work on getting some resources up on the city website as soon as we can. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bressy. Great. Uh, thank you, Director Miller. My question was about the East Link Centre Advisory Committee that Council recently appointed. I wonder if you know offhand or if you don't, if you could email us after just if the first meeting for that group's been set yet and when it might be able, when it's going to start meeting. Uh, through the Chair, uh, I don't have that information, but I'll certainly get it and email it out to all the Council. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Director Miller? Seeing none, then we will move on to item 1.2, Transit on Demand update. And I believe we'll hear from Mr. Harvard on that. Mr. Harvard, are you there? Yes, good morning. Can well, you hear me? Yes. Awesome, thanks. Thank you, Chair and Councillors. Um, um, uh, the report uh, that you have in front of you is, is uh, just an update on transit on demand. Um, committee members have had the opportunity to review the report. So I'm going to provide highlights and answer any questions that you might have uh, at the end, if that's all right. Um, so transit in Grand Prairie, we're in a transition right now. We're moving from a system that, that was purely focused on large buses delivering service on a fixed schedule um, to one that's going to have three different level of, levels of service delivery. Um, we will continue to have, there'll be an aspect of the fixed route using the larger buses. Demand is high. Uh, when demand is lower, we're going to be using smaller buses. And then the third component is going to be this, this new piece, which is uh, on demand, uh, which will also use the smaller buses. And this is when demand is lowest and also with areas that have very little demand and potentially areas that we do not currently serve uh, right now. Um, so um, the, the on-demand packages, regardless of, of, of the vendor, they all very much emulate what we currently have in our accessible transit. Um, so what we did is we engaged our, our current vendor and asked them what they had in terms of a software package uh, and an application for the on-demand piece. Um, unfortunately, they're working on it. It wasn't ready uh, for uh, to be released at all to the market. Uh, so what we did then is we um, uh, we um, engaged internal stakeholders, both from IT and procurement, and the decision was made that the best course of action would be to go out to RFP in uh, Q1 of next year and find a product that is all-encompassing, that can do both the accessible transit piece uh, and also on-demand. Um, but... Um, and what we are hoping as well is that this, uh, the product will enable us to um, mix and match. So, for instance, an accessible bus will go out, but also will pick up on-demand clients as well. Um, in addition to all of that, we're hoping that, uh, and there's no reason not to have this type of functionality, is that the, um, the, there'll be an application, and through that application, people will be able to book their own trips, cancel their own trips, and they'll also have the ability to uh, track their, their vehicle as it's coming towards them. Uh, so those are sort of the, um, the pickups, uh, you know, that we, that we currently do not have uh, at all. Um, and it's uh, certainly in the marketplace. We, we, are, we are very aware of a number of different vendors who can offer this to us. Uh, so we're quite, uh, quite excited to, to try to get this off the ground and move forward with it. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, that's, that's where we are right now with On Demand. Uh, certainly open up to all questions. Thank you, Mr. Harvard. Are there questions, uh, Councillor Bressy? 
Great, thank you, Chair Blackburn. Yeah, I really appreciate the support. I'm excited to uh, hear us playing with this technology a little bit. I've ridden on-demand transit in other communities, and I really do think it's got potential to both improve our service for riders while also saving taxpayers money, which is exciting to me. I also think the other thing that's exciting for me is the idea of somebody with disabilities. It gives them so much dignity if they're riding the same bus, using the same app as anybody else in the community instead of having to have their special transit. Again, that's something that is more cost efficient for taxpayers likely, but also is just so much better for that person with disabilities riding a bus. So I'm excited about this. My question though is we've got a new hospital coming in with a GPRC ex expansion that's going to put more demand on our system. We've also got this fair, potentially disruptive in a good way technology coming into our community. It seems to me that that, cha that probably changes the expected service level we'll have in our community. And I'm curious what the plans are for, if there are any plans yet for there to be council discussion about as things are changing in our community, what are our expectations with transit in terms of the service level that we expect to be delivered to residents? Is that something that's planned to be a conversation with council at this point, or is that something that's just planned so far to be at the administrative level? Through the chair. Thank you, Councillor Bessie. Um, in all reality, we've been working on uh, plans for the new hospital for the past four months. Um, the intent is to uh, put our plans together. Uh, um, in, uh, at that point in time, we will be going out to both council, but also to public outreach. Uh, it's important to get the public aspect and their, uh, their input on the changes that we're looking at. Uh, but clearly, you know, um, from my perspective, uh, council has the full authority to make the decisions on both the routing and the service levels. And to that extent, then, you know, uh, all of council will, will absolutely get lots of, uh, lots of notice, lots of information as we move forward, and certainly the final uh, vote on how this uh, system should, uh, should be funded and should be scheduled. Uh, what we're looking at, to, you know, in a quick thumbnail is uh, a total redesign of the system. So it'll be one of those, I like to call it, you turn the lights off, you turn the lights on, and it's a totally different picture. Uh, we're taking this opportunity to look holistically at the entire system. There are areas that we currently serve that I will be honest with you, get one ride a day. So there's eight hours of service, one ride a day. Doesn't make any sense at all. So we're looking at making the entire system efficient. Uh, we're layering on different routes, different routing, making sure that we take into account all, all of the, uh, the known requests that we have. Um, as Councillor, or sorry, as Director Miller mentioned earlier, uh, we have been in contact with GPRC. So uh, I have uh, gotten some preliminary information for their classes and their requests for the type of services that we're looking for. That will certainly be layered into all of our plans as well. Uh, so yeah, we're, there's lots going to be happening next year in terms of moving, in terms of service delivery, and different kinds of service delivery. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned. It's going to be an interesting year, absolutely. And if I may, thank you, Chair Blackburn. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, and I guess just sharing a little bit of my hopes for the process as somebody who's very keenly interested in transit is, uh, even though I'm very interested in transit, I've got next to no desire to be delving into the route selection and what actual routes routes look like. So I hope that we'll be involved in the process long before that happens. Cause the conversation I'm more interested in having at council is things like uh, what, how long do we think it's reasonable to wait for a bus in our community? And what are the hours of service we expect on weekdays versus weekends? And that very high level service level conversation is what I'm interested in having council do. And then personally, I'm not really interested in us talking about individual routes. I think that if we set a service level, it's administration can go and at least in my opinion and figure out in each community should that in each community at particular times is that service level expectation best met by traditional transit on a fixed route or is it met by on demand? And that's a conversation I'm not really interested in having. I'm just personally interested in having that early what's our expectation of service conversation personally. Thank you, Councillor Bressi. Are there any other questions for Mr. Harvard? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to accept his report for information. 
Thank you, Mayor Gavin. Yeah, no, sorry, uh, I move we receive your information. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Thank you, those in favor? Thank you, that passes unanimously and we and thank you, Mr. Harvard. We can now move on to next item, which is the uh, Pursuit of Excellence and Arts Development Committee, um, Ms. Bieberdorf. Good morning, thank you, Chair Blackburn. Uh, in October of 2019, Council directed administration to implement the changes necessary to modernize the city's approach to boards and committees. And then on June 1st, 2020, Council approved amendments to bylaw C-1422, which included the Pursuit of Excellence and Arts Development Committees being dissolved by January 1st, 2021. Both legacy funds are still available and accessible to the community and do require a decision-making body to review applications and make recommendations to Council for funding allocations. Uh, the mandate of the new Community Advisory Committee is to advise the city on significant recreation and cultural projects, ongoing engagement, beautification and community pride, pride and events, uh, making it an appropriate fit to provide recommendations to Council. Administration recommends that beginning January 1st, 2021, all Pursuit of Excellence and Arts Development Committee applications are reviewed by the Community Advisory Committee and recommendations will then be made. Thank you, Ms. Bieberdorf. Any uh, uh, questions? Uh, seeing none, then I will entertain a motion as uh, in the recommendation. Uh, Mayor Given? Mayor Given? Uh, you. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Councilor Blackburn. Um, yeah, or, or any other motion anybody want to make? You know, so I, uh, I'm okay uh, with the motion, the uh, report, I guess, just an observation for Council. Um, as we think about the uh, Community Advisory Committee and who we appoint to that in the future, uh, we should really take into account um, the, the, the role of giving out these grant funds or, or making recommendations for these grant funds. In the past, with the Pursuit of Excellence and Arts Development Committee, we actually sought members that had sport experience or, you know, or experience in arts and culture, sort of as subject matter experts, if you, if you will. Um, and so uh, at, at first blush, I was a little bit hesitant on, on this recommendation, just sort of feeling that we're gonna be losing that expertise um, that it you know, provided us insightful uh, thoughts about uh, you know, the different applications that we'd receive. And I appreciate that maybe this is just a change that over time we'll have to try to incorporate that expertise into, uh, we should be looking for those as qualifications in the members that we appoint to the Community Advisory Committee. So uh, it may be something that Council in the future wants to think about, um, or administration might want to amend the uh, uh, skills matrix for the Community Advisory Committee uh, to at least identify you know, cultural group experience, uh, sporting group experience as important competencies when Council considers public member appointments to this uh, to this body in the future. So, um, but you know, uh, that, all that said, uh, happy to support this transition, and uh, would be comfortable moving the motion contained in the report. Thank you, Mayor Given. Uh, just a, a comment on your uh, comments regarding the makeup of the committee. I I think that that can be accomplished in time for uh, the appointments to be made. I don't know that we would need. Um, uh, anything more than council's recognition of that need as we uh, as we uh, look for our uh, candidates. Um, any other discussion on Mayor Given's motion as per the recommendation, Ms. Ibrador? Thank you. I just wanted to add that we did incorporate some of those items into the matrix for this committee, and our intention was to advise. Uh, both the Arts Development and Pursuit of Excellence committees of the deadline to apply for the new committee and encourage them to apply if they are interested in continuing on. Great news, thank you. Uh, any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Those in favor? And that is uh, unanimously passed. Thank you very much, Ms. Bieberdorf, for your report. 
And uh, now we will move on to item 1.4, South Peace Regional Archives space proposal. And I see that uh, Ms. Casale is on the agenda, but I also see that uh, we're going to hear from Alyssa Curry. So uh, whoever wants to start, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that um, I'll start and then if uh, the um, executive director for the archives or their um, group has any comments to add, then um, they can certainly do that. So currently, um, as indicated in the administrative report, the South Peace Regional Archives is located at the Grand Prairie um, Museum, but their space that they're in does not quite uh, meet their needs. So administration has collaborated with Archives Administration to develop the relocation strategy that is outlined in this report. Currently, the tenant space um, that is occupied in the basement is Center 2000, known as the Heritage Discovery Center. It is currently occupied by the city of Grand Prairie and contains city exhibits. So if the re recommendation is supported, the impact would be that the current city um, exhibits would be removed from the Heritage Discovery Center. With that space renovated, it would allow for the Archive Society um, to move into that basement space of Center 2000. Once the archives um, relocates from their current uh, space, then that would make renovation um, at the Grand Prairie Museum possible for um, us to expand at that location and relocate some of the exhibits that were um, are currently housed at the uh, Heritage Discovery Center. So um, the proposal does require the society to be able to negotiate a suitable lease with the Center 2000 Board and the board has indicated that there is support um, to consider having them as a tenant in that space. So um, the report also outlines the commitment from the society and its board of directors and administration recommends and council approve, approve the process, proposal for the South Peace Regional Archives to relocate to the Heritage Discovery Center space at Center 2000 and no sooner than 2023. Thank you, Ms. Casually. Uh, any comments to come from Ms. Hudson? I'm not seeing Ms. Hudson come on screen, so uh, I'll move to asking if there are questions for Ms. Casually. Councillor Pilat. Uh, thanks, Chair Blackburn. I'm just I'm wondering, um, I'm definitely in support of this. I'm just wondering, it's got on here no sooner than 2023. And I guess I'm just wondering um, why that date is so long uh, or if it just lines up with other things that are going on. Um, I know Archives had an, had an appetite. This is a very passionate group of people that want to see a new home. And, and uh, I know myself and, and other councillors have worked with them over the years to try to find them a new home. So. I'm just wondering if there's any way to do it sooner or if there's a reason that we're wanting it not to be till 2023. Uh, Ms. Casually. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so the timeframe was actually suggested by the Archive Society and Board of Directors. Um, my understanding um, is that uh, this will allow them some time to do additional fundraising. They maybe um, are prepared currently to contribute financially to the renovation costs of the space, and this will allow them for um, additional time to do fundraising for that and also to seek um, alternative funding sources for um, operating and capital that may be required for the um, relocation to the new space. Okay, thank you for that. I wasn't aware of that. I'm on a steering committee with them, but we haven't met a whole lot since COVID, so that I'm, I'm happy to hear that this lines up with what Archives is looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've, I've been reminded that um, I called the wrong name. Is uh, Ms. Curry, is there anything that you wanted to add to this? And Councillor Friesen, I did see you. Hi there. Um, can everyone hear me? can hear okay. you and I, I apologize for I, no that's okay i don't appear on screen so i just wanted to make sure that you can hear me um i just wanted to say on behalf of 
of the archives, um, both administration and board of directors, that we really appreciate the work that Ms. Cazale has put forward in working with us on this proposal. Um, it's been something that's been a long time coming, as many of you already know. Um, uh, Councillor Pallott referenced that we are passionate people and we're passionate about finding a home. We do feel that this would uh, meet our space requirements and provide us with the capacity for collection care and accessibility that we have really been striving for. Um, I'll, I'll just touch back to the, the, the time frame and Ms. Casually was absolutely correct. We are, have our eye on a few grants, for example, that um, need a little bit of lead time. So those are the types of fundraising activities that we'd be partaking in. Uh, during the next couple of years to ready ourselves for that move. Thank you for that, Ms. Curry. Uh, Councillor Friesen had a question. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Blackburn. It wasn't a question, it was more of a comment. Um, I uh, represent Council on the Archives Board, of course. And the other thing that I wanted to point out that um, Ms. Casually was very accurate in saying this is more time to um, raise not only some capital to help out, but also to ensure that the operational expenses, the increased expenditure for that space uh, will be doable for this organization. Uh, <clears throat> in, in that discussion to, we, we did consider, um, you know, there was a smaller space option and the larger space option. And it was important to the board that we do, that, that this be done um, right with a long term in mind rather than be done quickly. So the option to take the larger space was the decision, but the time lag is in order to um, uh, make sure that that will be manageable, financially manageable for the, for the archives. Thank you, Councillor Friesen. Councillor Palat. Uh, thanks, Chair Blackburn. I would just uh, be, be happy to put forward the motion, the recommendation from administration on this, that the committee recommends council approve the proposal for the South Peace Regional Archives to relocate to the Heritage Discovery Centre space no sooner than 2023. I, uh, I really want to thank administration. I know there was a lot of work. There's been a lot of dreams. There's been a lot of plans going around archives for a long time. I think this is a great fit. It is a regional style facility, so I think that's a great one. We do have funding partners from different groups or different, uh, you know, we've got... I think three or four other different funding, uh, uh, county, MD, uh, spirits, uh, sorry, forgetting all the funding partners, but anyways, I like that it's a regional facility. And I think that was something that originally when we talked about the location I like, but I like later on more that it is a regional facility in that nature. So I hope we can support this and we can find the archives. Uh, expanded space over time. Thank you, Councillor Palat. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Those in favor? And that passes unanimously. Thank you to Ms. Curry and uh, Ms. Cajole for your uh, participation in this and your report. Um, I don't have any items of other business, so we'll go to the outstanding items list. Uh, Director Miller. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just an update. Uh, so Angela Redding is planning for the first CKC Advisory Committee meeting at the end of November. She's looking at November 26th, and it'll be subject to uh, the availability of uh, the committee members. And then uh, on the oil, we have uh, two items, and they've both been uh, addressed today. So I think with with committee's permission, we can remove those two, and then our oil is, is sitting at zero for right now. That'll give us time to focus on the rec uh, facility. Which we most definitely will need. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, may I have a motion to uh, Councillor Platt. Uh, thanks, Chair uh, Blackburn. I would make a, mo a motion that we'd accept the outstanding item as, as amended. And a uh, little scary thought, but I guess we have no outstanding item this, uh, after this, so uh, it, it, will, it will be nice for administration to concentrate on that uh, facility, as Mr. Miller has made, stated, and it's great to see this uh, getting down to where we have no goals right now, and I'm sure we'll come up with some creative things to get back on there, but at this point, uh, I'd like to make that motion, please. Thank you, Councillor Pallad. Any discussion on the motion? Um, all those in favour? 
And that also passes unanimously. And that brings to a conclusion the, um, uh, the committee meeting. And uh, I'm not sure who's on next, but uh, thank you very much for your attention to this. Councillor Pallott is up next. Councillor Pallott, can I just request a five minute? It's been now a couple of hours. I just, I need a moment. Sure. If everybody's okay with that, I'm just looking at the clock here. It is 10.24. Why don't we recess till 10.30 and we'll come back then. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.
Ready, so we're gonna get back to start the Protective and Social Services Committee uh, as it is 10.30. On this committee is myself, uh, Councillor Freeson, Councillor O'Toole, and Mayor Gibbon. Um, so we'll start off with our item 1.1, our Director's Service Verbal Update, or Service Update. Uh, Director Emanuel, please. Okay, good morning. So I can report that uh, in community social development, um, We've been able to identify 120 mat locations for emergency uh, for emergency accommodation for street engaged populations. Uh, that's across um, three different locations. We are proceeding with stakeholder consultations for our Indigenous liaison position, uh, and that's scheduled to start in the first week of November. Um, in enforcement services, uh, they report that they've been busy busy working collaboratively with the mobile outreach program and uh, Rotary House over the past two weeks, and that uh, the collaborative approach is uh, discouraging tenting and encampments while also encouraging people to utilize the available services. Uh, within G prep and emergency management, I think everybody's uh, well aware that yesterday triggered our um, mandatory face covering bylaw. So uh, we're now rolling out education information regarding that program. Within the fire department, uh, they have two confirmed COVID cases that uh, required the temporary closing for uh, several hours of two different fire halls. But after deep cleaning, I can report that the uh, halls are all functional again and that fire response is being maintained at uh, normal levels. Uh, the RCMP uh, also had uh, several cases of uh, COVID-19 that resulted in uh, a number of isolations, but um, again, after a deep clean of the detachment um, and some, some moving of shifts, uh, all operations remain without disruption at this time. Um, some notable incidents at the RCMP, I think um, sadly many of us heard that on October 18th, um, Grand Prairie RCMP and Alberta Health Services responded to uh, multiple drug overdoses at a residence in town, where unfortunately two adults passed away and another two required hospitalization. And uh, Preliminary investigation revealed the substance involved was a crystallized bluish purple substance. Um, following that incident, um, some proactive work that occurred over that night, uh, where a traffic stop in the city of Grand Prairie on a suspicious vehicle ultimately resulted in the arrest of um, a subject and um, police subsequently seizing 47 grams of a purplish, bluish fentanyl substance and 53 grams of methamphetamine. Um, uh, hopefully that traffic stop uh, and subsequent seizure uh, prevented further overdoses from occurring in our community. Um, the RCMP did release a media release warning of the uh, potency of these street level drugs in the community and reminding people of the risks associated with their consumption. Um, the other note I have is our mobile outreach program. Uh, last week, I believe was their third week of uh, up until Wednesday, October 21st was their third week of reporting operations. And in that time, they had 83 calls for service um, that generated that were generated by businesses, enforcement services, the RCMP, hospital, shelters, and self-referrals. Um, additionally, they serviced 80 clients uh, individually. They relocated four clients to their home communities where they have natural supports. They supported three COVID positive um, members of the vulnerable community that required isolation picked up 51 needles and um, continue to engage and remove encampments and tenting. So uh, by all accounts, things are going fairly well with that uh, pilot project and that's my report. Okay, thanks for that, Director Manuel. Any questions, uh, Mayor Gibbon? 
Thanks, Councillor Plott. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, two, if I can, uh, and I'll start from the back, the, on the mobile outreach. Uh, Director Manuel, you know, it uh, sounds like uh, great results in the program so far. I've appreciated uh, you've emailed out some updates uh, from time to time with some of those statistics, super helpful. I wonder if administration would consider creating a section on the website or uh, that would that would showcase what the team is um, you know, uh, you know, a little bit of a description of what the intent is, and then provide those uh, statistics, you know, and update them there from time to time. I would really like to be able to point the community towards a page that 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 highlights the team, describes what the team does, and then demonstrates some of the outputs of the team. That would be really helpful. Um, I've wanted to maybe forward your emails, but it's just it's, it would be great if there was a link that you know that was cityofgp.com/mobileoutreach, and then we could help. Uh, we could have all of us on council could have a resource that we could send people to. Uh, I think it would probably get really well utilized. So that, a piece of advice or a request, I guess. Um, the second one was on the um, on the the two overdoses um, or or um, tainted drugs or however you want to sort of term it. And I'm not looking for information on a, a specific neighborhood or street or anything like that. But can you give us a sense of whether that happened in a neighborhood that that uh, the community would typically see as, you know, disadvantaged or challenged, or was it in a more uh, traditional, typical residential neighborhood? Because I, I, I have a sense that the community feels that uh, drug overdoses happen in the downtown core uh, to a certain kind of individual, and my impression is that th that might not have been the case here, and, and really more people are at risk than might people might generally think. So can you give us some sort of sense? Yeah, no, uh, good question. So uh, first off, yeah, absolutely. Uh, take the recommendation around um, sharing information around the mobile outreach program, and uh, we'll look at the forums there. Uh, we have been sharing it with the downtown association to distribute to their members as well. Um, in regard to the unfortunate overdoses there, um, that is a good point. Uh, what I can confirm is that it occurred in a, in a single family dwelling house in one of our more affluent neighborhoods, uh, well outside of the downtown core, and uh, frankly, in a in a home that did not have much history um, in regard to contact with the police. Eh? This would really, literally, be the victims of this one would be the neighbors you'd see in any residential neighborhood in this city, unfortunately. And you bring up a really good point that uh, Councillor Bressley will probably bring up in his next. Um, uh, agenda item for our meeting, but um, it is not limited to the street engaged population that are involved in the use of these drugs. The far more predominant user are everyday people we see uh, living in our neighborhoods and going to school and workplaces with us. So, uh, very good point. Th thanks for providing that additional context. I think it's just important for, for us to get out there as much as possible um, and uh, very, very, very tragic. Um, anytime anybody loses their lives, and maybe surprising to some members of our community about about who this is happening to. Thanks a lot for that detail. Thank, thanks for those questions, Mayor. Given and those comments, I think they were they are very fitting of, of a lot of people's thinking that everything's street engaged downtown. Uh, Councillor Friesen, you had your hand up. Um, thank you, and not to uh, dwell on this, but. Um, Pardon me, Director Manuel. Um, I think that some of the community may see the incident that you described as rather an isolated incident. And um, while that has hit the news, um, is there any indication that the batch was not isolated to that, that um, group of users? I, I think that um, I think the community needs to know that this was not uh, isolated. No, a hundred percent. And um, what people believe they are buying as street drugs um, are not pharmaceutical grade drugs, and in, in that the the quality control does not exist. Um, so. Although consumers may be thinking they're buying heroin or ecstasy, um, they're often quite surprised that the makeup of what they were buying is nowhere near what they thought it was. Um, and I think a rather consistent thing we've seen for the last number of years 
within the city of Grand Prairie and across probably the world, frankly, is that um, you think you're buying heroin, you're actually buying something that's 55% fentanyl, 45% heroin, or a mixture of five, six different other drug sources. And it, the supply chain on those precursors, uh, ingredients are, are what really influence all these things. The general message is none of them are safe. And um, that being said, we're not naive to the fact that some people are involved in those lifestyles and make those choices. And the real emphasis is if you're going to do it, use all the safety precautions available for you to do it. Um, you know, have somebody that's not consuming in a space that's able to call for help before you become all incapacitated or use the supervised consumption sites that exist and those sorts of things. You know, clearly our, our preference is, is deterrence and getting the appropriate treatments. And it's, but if you're going to consume, there's safer ways to do it. Okay. Uh, so I guess with that, we'll, thanks for your update, Director Manuel. We'll move on to item 2.1. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I think that's what oh, sorry, I missed you, uh, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Palat. Uh, sorry, I had to wave in there. Uh, just in regards to the new face masking, uh, well, the mandatory face masking bylaw being uh, enacted, um, I went black for a bit because uh, I was walking a dog last night and uh, somewhere along the way I lost my phone. So I was walking around Riverstone School, didn't find my phone. Uh, but what I did find was about 10 face masks um, in, in the school playground. I also saw three or four face masks on the sidewalks on my way um, to the school to retrace my steps. Uh, I guess as part of the education campaign for this, uh, was for the mandatory mask policy, uh, Director Manuel, how are we educating people to properly dispose of their masks and do we have a strategy around uh, enabling that to happen a bit more, considering that more people, everyone in our community is going to be wearing them now for at least the next two weeks. Uh, certainly. So I think we certainly have been recommending where possible that people use the uh, reusable face coverings as opposed to disposable masks just from the waste perspective. But uh, we do understand that there will be a proliferation of that and, and I'll work with bringing this back to our comms team to have discussion as to some messaging we can provide. Uh, I will put in my little plug right now that uh, from an enforcement perspective, that um, it's great that people are going to be compliant wearing the masks. Uh, we still do have littering laws that exist within the city and across the country. And uh, we encourage people not to dump garbage on streets. Okay, no, thank you very much for that. Um, I guess uh, yeah, my a follow up question to that is uh, obviously our parks people or or just our maintenance people, whoever is going to end up picking up a lot of these masks. What kind of protocols do we have in place to ensure that they're not picking up any germs? Uh, are they using grabbers? Uh, are they picking them up with gloves? Uh, what's our strategy around there with the litter? Uh, I can say Christy Lee, our our health and safety. Um, coordinator for the city there has a very robust uh, safe work procedures for a, a number of these sort of things. Honestly, I don't think we would treat the masks much different than we would any other item of uh, that, that may have some sort of biological uh, substance on it. Uh, so I, I think we regularly use latex gloves or devices such as grabbers, like you mentioned, to properly pick things up. But we will uh, again, ensure that our staff are, are well aware, and we can echo some of that messaging in the community as well, how to properly dispose of stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no further hands up, uh, we'll move on to item 2.1, the Community Opioid Task Force, and uh, this was an item added by Councillor Bressy, so I'll ask him to speak to it, please. Great. Well, thank you. So the Community Opioid Response Task Force was something that was convened by Mayor Given back in early 2018, I believe, although he could correct me on my dates a little bit. But my, understand, but my recollection was as Mayor Given looking around and saying, we've got an opioid crisis in all of North America that's hitting our community hard, and we need to get the community together to figure out how to address it. And although Mayor Given kind of convened it and called it together. It, he was really intentional about it not being a mayor-given thing or a city of Grand Prairie thing, but saying, 
we're going to get the community at the table to talk about how to impact opioids. And I, uh, I've been involved involved in it over the last couple of years, along with Councillor Thiessen and Mayor Givens' continued involvement. I just wanted to give you a bit of an update because there's some potential changes coming to the task force. So I wanted to loop Council in on what was going on. Before I get to some of the changes we're going to make, though, a few of the successes the task force has had is one of the first things it did was it created a needle disposal guide to help people in the community know what to do when they find a needle, whether they need to call for help or whether they want to deal with it themselves. They know how to do either safely now. Uh, the task force was successful in getting a provincial grant to create a series of Everyone is Impacted videos, which were just people in the community giving lived experience about the impact of opioids on their lives with the goal of reducing the stigma a little bit and encouraging people to reach out for, for support when they need it. The task force has put together a website, everyoneisimpacted.ca, which includes all kinds of resources about how people can get it includes a lot of great information, but the most important to me is resources to get help with tr with treatment or recovery or harm reduction in our community. And that website to date has had over 15,000 views, so it's been well utilized in our community. Uh, the, we've done a number of education sessions with uh, both ones that are open to the public and going into companies, going into other organizations to educate their people about harm reduction and how they can and how they can get recovery and treatment and help if they need it. And in all these actions, I think it's really important for people to understand that there's a four pillar approach that the task force ta has taken. Often in the political world, we hear about harm reduction strategies, and that is one of the pillars that the task force is focused on, but also has been focused on not just harm reduction, but also prevention. So people don't get stuck using opioids in the first place and also treatment and recovery. So people that are stuck in a cycle of addiction can get out of that cycle of addiction. And also at the table, there's been RCMP at our meetings because enforcement is a part of this too. Enforcement in terms of people that are bringing illegal drugs into our community, there should be consequences for that and working to help there be more, con more consequences. So I think the task force has been has had a lot of notable successes so far, and I think it's been a good thing to our community. But to be bluntly honest about where it's gone is it's become mostly frontline agencies coming to the table in a very working group manner. And there's been a lot of success in the task force in terms of better coordination of services for our street involved and our most vulnerable residents. But the task force has recognized that it has that there's still a lot of growth to do in terms of reaching out to people who aren't street involved, who are who own a home or rent a home and are using out in the community, as we heard today, who are often actually the people dying in our community are often the people that are dying in a home that they own or they rent and they're alone in a bathroom or they're alone in a living room or they're with or there with some friends who don't realize that they've got a bad batch batch in their home. And the task force is realizing that more needs to be done to reach out to those people. And so what the task force is doing is it's making a bit of a pivot. And instead, uh, where, where it's going is instead of being a monthly meeting of frontline agencies to talk about the real nuts and bolts of work in the community, it's going to move to it's going to move to a subcommittee structure where those frontline organizations that need to work together will still be meeting me, meeting monthly, but it'll be subcommittees of the task force as a whole. And the task force is going to become a quarterly meeting instead. And we're really hoping to bring in more community players to have more involvement from organizations such as the school boards, which have already been invited to GPRC and other educational institutions. We're hoping we know that a majority of fatalities in our community come start start in the trades. And so we'd love to have the Petroleum Association. We'd love to have the Construction Association at the, at the table. We'd love to. Uh, we'd love to have more business organizations at the, at the table. And where we're going to be reaching out over the next few weeks is asking a lot more organizations to come join the task force table. Instead of monthly working meetings, it's going to be quarterly meetings that'll be about one third just helping them have an under, helping these community partners have an understanding of what's going on with opioids in our community. About one third asking for their advice on our response and about one third asking them to help us get the word out to their networks about the resources for treatment, recovery and harm reduction that are available in our community. And so as we make this pivot to uh, involve more community partners, I wanted to keep that council updated, but also I've got two asks of council. And one is, uh, attached to this agenda is the terms of reference for the committee. And I think we're very open to council's advice on how this 
how this task force can better serve the community. So I'd love any advice you have to offer. But my other ask of council is over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be sending a lot of emails and making a lot of phone calls to recruit and to get more players around that table. And if any of you know an organization, have a connection to an organization that should be at the table that I might not have that connection, I'm just asking to, hey, put your recruitment hat on and either let me know who I should be calling or else maybe consider making a phone call on the task, task force behalf. So a bit of an update and two asks for council that I've got. Okay, thanks for that, Council Bressley. Is that, uh, we'll open that up for conversation or discussion here. Uh, did anybody want to, I'm not seeing any hands jumping up here, anybody want to make any comments on Councilor Bressey's? I think Councilor O'Toole is looking to get in. Sorry, Councilor O'Toole? Well, thank you. Uh, just a question to uh, Mr. Bressey. Uh, were you looking for an uh, individual that may have his fingers in a number of organizations as well? Would that, uh, you know, as a community member and uh, maybe travels a little bit where he's in, in contact with a number of different, say, oil field uh, uh, construction uh, groups, and uh, would that be working for you? Yeah, and we were really intentional in writing the terms of reference to be really flexible who's at the table. So individuals are welcome to join the task join the task force if they've got a broad perspective and they can be good partners at that table, then yeah, by all means individuals are welcome to join the task force. Also, but again, we wanted maximum flexibility. So also an organization is welcome to take a seat where they commit to hopefully sending the same person to the meetings, but not having to send the same person to those meetings. So we want to be flexible so either an individual can join the task force or an organization can join the task force. Okay, well, I've got a contact I'll be sending you a little bit later today. And and a, and a question that I, that I should have mentioned before that I know some might have in terms of do I want council to endorse these terms of reference or just have for information? That's, that's kind of up to council. It really is something, it really, this task force really is something that that my hope is it's city backbone, but community owned. And so it's not really something where I'd like to see the city coming in and saying, hey, here's here's what we want. But if council wants to take an action such as endorsing this show that they really believe in this, or if they want to give advice to the task force, by all means, I'll kind of leave it up to you folks what you want to do with this inf with, with this information. Um, so, so yeah, I know that's a question I've had, but I'll leave that up to you folks what you want to do. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mayor Given. Yeah, uh, thanks, Councillor Plot, uh, Chair Plot. Uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Councillor Bressy and Councillor Thiessen uh, both for their work on the uh, task force over the last little while. Um, Councillor Bressy's sort of history of it was was correct. I, I did initiate it after suggestion from community members, and I just really want to acknowledge that it wasn't my idea alone. Um, but uh, so, and uh, after initiating it. Um, and being involved, uh, I thought it was really important to broaden the circle. And so I really appreciate uh, Councillor Thiessen and Bressy stepping up, and Councillor Bressy in particular bringing this forward uh, with the committee. Um, the more people that are involved, the better uh, in terms of building understanding out there in the community and, and really leveraging the knowledge and resources of the community. Um, I Just on this last question, I think it's important for, I think it, it could be useful for Council to endorse the terms of reference. I don't, I, and I'm specific in endorse, I don't think we should approve them. I think it is driven by the community. Uh, the task force is fully in charge of developing their own terms of reference of what they want to be in the role they think they can should fill them. Um, I think it's important for Council to endorse them though, because we're saying the City of Grand Prairie is willing to continue to be the administrative backbone. Uh, and provide that ongoing support. So there is sort of a, it's not a, and, and I think we're all sort of aware of the resource requirements. It's not a, you know, it's not a big dollar ask, but it is, we are, we are by doing that, I think we are confirming that council is supportive of administration using their time to provide that administrative support. And so I think that that explicit endorsement is really useful, um, even though we're not approving the terms of reference. So if and when we're ready to do something like that, Councillor Plot, I'd be happy to make that motion to refer to Council for endorsement. Um, but yeah, just, just that little distinction, it's different than we typically do, um, and that's okay. Um, but we are, at least in part, saying that we're okay with staff, uh, which is a resource and staff time, uh, being dedicated to this. And I think we should, should say so explicitly. Okay, and, and so if you wanted to entertain a motion, I think, Mayor Gibbon, that would be a good time. I, okay. I think maybe yeah. Councillor O'Toole had his hand up, but it might have been for a similar reason. 
Okay. Well, well, sure. So I'll, I'll move that the committee uh, recommend council endorse the proposed uh, terms of reference for the community opioid response task force um, period. And for all the reasons I just stated. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. So um, any conversation? I, see, I did see Councillor O'Toole was having his hand up. I'm not sure if it was to make the similar recommendation, but uh, any conversation on the motion? Uh, Councillor O'Toole, if you're trying to, you're muted, I think, if you're trying to speak, sorry. Okay, sorry. I, I just wanted to uh, ask the mayor or the committee that's uh, on the app, app. Uh, opioid task force if they wanted the motion today or if they wanted to revamp the or uh, review the, uh, the the terms of reference but uh, I'm fine with what was done today okay thank you okay so we we do have a motion from mayor given um, I, I guess uh, I'll just see uh, councillor Blackburn put his hand up so I'll go to him first then I can go to mayor given if he would like to close or we can call the question in favor Thank you, and uh, so uh, kudos to the task force and all of those on it for the work that they've done so far. And I really don't want to be picky about the items in the uh, terms of reference, but the one thing I am curious about is the intention to have four meetings per year and the expectation that any member is only required to attend at least two meetings per year. Uh, I'd be interested in uh, your comment on that, uh, Councillor Bressy. Yeah, and I'm happy, I'm happy to speak to that. It's a, uh, it is again, we wanted maximum flexibility and we know that when we're asking some organizations to, to get involved there, uh, so sorry, we wanted maximum flexibility, but also we're hoping that when organizations send somebody to the table, that it's somebody with some decision-making capacity in the organization. We're hoping that as much as possible, there's somebody who's empowered to actually speak for an organization, not somebody who's just empowered to bring information back to the organization. And so to give more flexibility for those kinds of very busy decision makers in the community to attend at least some meetings, we wanted to give that, that flexibility. And especially because the task force really is going to be mostly of it's going to largely be an advice giving body to those frontline organizations that are doing the work. So the actual work and the actual nuts and bolts will be done by subcommittees. And I'd expect that there'll be a higher expectation of consistent attendance when actual work's being done. Uh, we'd love to have those organizations at the table every time we're asking for advice, but we'd like to have them at the table, period, rather than not having them at all. Let it. Satisfies Councillor Blackburn. That's good. And so I think, uh, unless Mayor Given wanted to close, I think we can probably call a uh, question all in favor of the motion. Sorry, I'm just trying to see uh, Councillor O'Toole's hand up on my. <laughs> and I believe that passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll go to back to uh, our outside of item list. Uh, Director Manuel, please. Uh, certainly. So the. Uh, list remains as presented. Uh, no changes here today. Everything remains on track. Okay, so I just look for a motion for that, please. Right, Councilor O'Toole. Yeah, I make a motion to accept the outstanding items list as presented. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, call the question. All those in favor? And that passes unanimously as well. Thank you. And uh, I think that puts an end or close to the Protective and Social Services Committee meeting today. Thank you. And I'm not sure who's next up on the agenda. Councillor Minos will be next. And I think it's possible Councillor Minhas uh, had to go. I believe he had an appointment at 11 and he might not have been able to uh, stay for that. And so I think uh, we're going to our next chair, which is Councillor O'Toole. You're going to take over? Yes, that's correct, Mayor Given. Uh, Councilor Min has asked me to step in and take over the meeting today. So uh, thank you for attending the Corporate Services Committee meeting for October 27th. Uh, those that are in attendance uh, will be Councilor Friesen, uh, myself and Mayor Given, and if everybody else can just blank their screens so we get good reception. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Director Services Area Update. That's a verbal update from uh, CLT member Shane Burke. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Chair O'Toole. Uh, budget is scheduled for November 12th and 13th. Uh, we're on track to uh, publicly publish the uh, budget material uh, next week for the community to take a look at that uh, before, um, before we get to deliberations. 
uh, community advisory committee was uh, something that came up earlier today. Um, the applications are available on the website. Uh, we will be doing a public call uh, for, for those uh, um, for members that are interested in joining that here in the next couple of days. Uh, it was scheduled earlier this week, but uh, we've held off as COVID messaging has uh, taken over, but that will happen shortly and the applications are available uh, online. Uh, I would speak a little bit about uh, the temporary mandatory mask bylaw that uh, the city of uh, Grand Prairie, uh, in conjunction with the, with the numbers from the county, hit the threshold yesterday uh, for uh, for mandatory masks in uh, indoor public spaces. Uh, we're we're really appreciative of all the businesses that are trying to get into compliance and all the number of questions that we we are receiving. Um, um, our plan is is that we are gathering these questions right now. We will be including a frequently asked questions. Uh, um, section on our, our website. We'll also be communing some of the common ones through our social media channels. Uh, what, what I would encourage is that uh, um, businesses and, and residents uh, sign up for our daily uh, COVID updates uh, through our service announcements. We'll be providing updates every day and some of the common themes that we're hearing and providing that feedback uh, to the community uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the bylaw is intentionally uh, does not outline every scenario uh, that does allow businesses to uh, make some operational decisions as they're as they're implementing this. If I were to give a couple of uh, key messages for for today and for the rest of this week is that uh, the city really is in an education mode that we are uh, looking to uh, to uh, inform the public about uh, um, the, the activation of this bylaw and uh, that there won't be uh, enforcement officials going around shutting down businesses. That is not going to happen uh, here. This is really an education phase of, of this project. Um, uh, I would also uh, uh, recommend that businesses uh, look to uh, um, securing some of the uh, mandatory signage that is required in the bylaw. That can either be printed through our website or we're making arrangements with the Downtown Association and the Chamber of Commerce uh, to have printed copies and some pickup locations available in the next couple of days. So over the next couple of days, that would be something I would ask businesses to do is to, uh, to post that signage. For, for residents, the key message here right now is if you're going out shopping, put a mask on. That, that is uh, really the, the easy way to, uh, to, to come into compliance. Um, I'd also uh, just briefly mention as uh, one thing we're looking at uh, in advance of uh, budget is how we vote now that we've gone back to a more mixed medium Zoom and uh, in-person meetings. Uh, and I'll be talking to council over the next few days about an option for us to move, uh, move up our rollout of our meeting management system, which has uh, some app-based voting. We did some really good tests yesterday and it's a really uh, slick program, but it would take some willingness for council to change here in the next week or so um, how we look at uh, uh, agenda management and how you vote. So I think it's completely doable, but it's something I'll have a discussion with councillors uh, over the next few days, but whether this is something that uh, interests them. And with that, that is my uh, update here this morning. Are there any questions uh, to com or, uh, committee chair, uh, corporate services director, Shane Burke? I see none, so thank you very much, Mr. Burke. We'll move on to item 1.2, the tax recovery sale for 2019. Uh, we have Mr. Scott Smith. Can you take over the floor here, sir? Sure, thank you, uh, Chair O'Toole. Uh, so before you today are three recommendations in regards to the 2019 uh, tax recovery sale. And as you know, this is the process which we go through annually. Uh, it's a little later this year. We've pushed it back as far as we can uh, due to COVID. Uh, so this is a process that actually began back in March of 2019. Uh, so in March of 2019, the tax department filed 238 tax recovery notifications on properties that had more than one year uh, outstanding taxes. Uh, so that would mean that they had outstanding taxes from 2017 and all of 2018 as well. Uh, currently, there's 46 properties that remain uh, on the tax roll where those notifications were filed. Uh, the actual number of properties uh, that are available uh, on the day of the actual tax sale, they've been very minimal in the past. Some, typically, we have none. Uh, as property owners and mortgage companies, uh, we'll always or typically bring the accounts up to date after um, this process begins. Uh, and under the MGA, these properties, they must be offered for sale or public auction not sooner than April 1st of 2020 and not later than March 31st, 2021. 
typically, it's been the city's practice over the past uh, to hold our tax sale on the last Friday of November. Uh, however, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're extending this date as late as we can to March 19th of 2021. Uh, each parcel of land uh, to be offered for sale has a reserve bid that's close to market value as possible. Uh, there will be an ad placed in the Alberta Gazette on uh, January 30th of 2021. Uh, letter, uh, along with a copy of the Gazette ad, will be sent to property owners and anyone else who has an interest uh, registered to the property. And there will also be an ad in the Daily Herald Tribune on March 1st, or sorry, March 5th of 2021. Uh, the 46 properties represent a little over $910,000 in receivables. Uh, and included in the report, you will find some attachments with the relevant sections of the NGA, uh, the schedule of proceedings, how we, the dates, uh, when things will be done, uh, the list of properties and the, the list of reserve bids. Uh, and with that, uh, administration is requesting that committee recommend council approve the recommendations in the report. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. Okay, anybody from committee want to ask questions to Mr. Smith? I see nobody. So anybody that's not on the committee want to ask questions? I see nobody, so I'm looking for the uh, the motions that are laid out uh, in the recommendations. So, Councillor Friesen, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, just bear with me while I look for the, there we go. So I move that corporate service group, <clears throat> that we recommend to council uh, to approve the following, uh, that property subject to 2019 tax recovery notification as per the list be offered for sale by public auction, that the auction be held on the first floor of the North Conference Room at City Hall on Friday, March 19th, 2021 at 9 a.m., and that the reserve bids for the 2019 tax recovery sale be set as per the appendix D. Okay, uh, Mr. Smith, just one question. Do you want them all as one motion or do we want to do them independently? Um, that might be more of a question for Ledge Services. Uh, I would think they could be all done by one, but I'd want uh, Amanda or Arlene to verify that. We want to do her right, so if Arlene, Ms. Karbuszewski, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you through the chair. Can you please uh, repeat the question? So the recommendations are the, th the three uh, items, one, two, and three. Did, would, would one motion satisfy the needs of legislative services or did they need to be done individually? Thank you, through the chair. Uh, all three motions are germane and can be um, at this committee's uh, general consent can be made in one motion. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Councillor Friesen made them all at once. So, uh, any debate or questions at this time? I see none. So, uh, all in favor? of the motions on the table. Okay, that passes unanimously. Ms. Friesen, myself, and Count their Mayor Given, and uh, there's no, that's unanimous, so woohoo, we're done. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Smith, and uh, we'll move on to the next item, and that is the bylaw C-1396B, the attached amendment to the Swan City Hockey Association loan bylaw. And Ms. Uh, Whiteway, if you would like to uh, speak on this, please. Thank you, Tara O'Toole. Um, so administration does ask the committee recommend council give three readings to bylaw C-1396B. So in March of 19, the original bylaw was passed and authorized the city to uh, provide a loan to the Swan City Hockey Association. Uh, that principal amount loaned was $200,000. Uh, in June of this year, uh, an amendment was made to extend the term of the loan from the original five to five and a half years. And the Swan City Hockey Association has asked 
that the city allow deferral of payment again on the outstanding loan. This is in light of their cash flow constraints due to uh, COVID-19. They've requested to defer their October 2020 and January and April of 2021 payments. So this will increase the term of the loan to six years, being paid in full by October, October of 2025. Uh, the interest will remain at four and a quarter percent. So deferral of payment um, for the Swan City Hockey Association loan would allow this organization to better manage their cash flows uh, during these times. And it has minimal financial impact uh, for the city, can easily be managed by administration. Thank you. All right. So committee members, uh, any questions, concerns? Uh, Ms. Friesen. Um, thank you. I know that the um, the public has a lot of questions about or um, some criticism of whether or not council should have um, provided this loan to begin with. And um, I'm certainly happy to defer, but I think that there we, we will be faced with some questions from the public about how the association has been doing to date with uh, meeting the terms. Can you comment on that? Uh, through the chair. Certainly, so they do provide uh, financial updates to us regularly. Um, unfortunately, due to capacity constraints and um, not being able to get sponsorship revenue like they once could, they can't get the seat sales that they had anticipated. Uh, their cash flow is not what would have once been anticipated prior to COVID. Um, but for the requirements of providing us uh, updates, they have been doing so. Thank you. And just to, just to follow up, um, prior to COVID, had they also been meeting the, the repayment um, requirements? After the chair, yes, they had made all payments prior to that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Uh, Mayor Gibbon, you had your hand up. I did, but uh, Council Friesen uh, got exactly what I was looking to get to. Had they been making their payments, they have um, COVID changed things, and that's the reason that this is here. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I see no other uh, questions from the committee. Anybody from council have questions at this time? I see nobody rushing to stick their hand up. So I'm looking for a motion at this time. And I'm happy to make that motion, uh, Chair O'Toole. Uh, I move that uh, committee recommend council give three readings to bylaw C 1396B. Um, and speaking to that, uh, as we just heard, the Swan City Hockey Association has been current in making their payments under this loan. Um, and up until, uh, you know, we all came into the situation that we are, uh, appreciate the impact that that would have on their cash flow. And this is not unexpected. This is just one example of how many different community organizations uh, are feeling the pinch from COVID the same way many different businesses are. Um, I would also want to sort of highlight that this is a interest bearing loan. Um, and so the interest uh, term will be extended, uh, you know, so the city of Grand Prairie uh, is not doing this for free uh, for the association. They are still required to pay that interest and the interest uh, that will go along with the term, um, you know, uh, so recognizing all those reasons and the fact that the uh, club has in good faith uh, been paying on their commitments. Uh, I would encourage committee members to support this. So thank you very, Mayor, Mayor sir. Thank you very much, Mayor Given, for uh, bringing up those important items that you mentioned, uh, as it may ease the tension that uh, or the concerns that Councillor Friesen had brought up. So with that, uh, all in favor? Okay, motion passes. So committee's there. Uh, we're next on to the outstanding items list. And that is uh, uh, Director Shane Bork. Uh, thank you, Councillor O'Toole. Uh, we're on track for all three items for the date uh, um, provided. Uh, no changes to the list today. Thank you very much. Uh, who wants to make the motion? I, I don't know who I should choose here. Uh, Councillor Friesen, let's get you in on the, on the list there. All right, um, so moved. Thank you very much. Uh, all in favor? And that's done. And with that, uh, Corporate Services Committee meeting is done for the day. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Great wall.
Thank you, Councillor O'Toole. And are there any objections to us jumping right into infrastructure economic development? I'm not seeing anything. So with that, I will call the infrastructure and economic development meeting for today to order. And just to note, Council recently had an organizational meeting. With that, there's been a slight shuffling on this committee. And so committee members are now myself, Councillors Thiessen, Councillor Blackburn, and Mayor Given. Uh, also, a note that we had last night, we had a delegation request come in. So we've got a slight change to the agenda, and that is we'll start with delegation business. And I know that Mr. Rosler and Pravis are online to speak to item 1.3, which is secondary suites regulations. So, Mr. Rosler, Mr. Pravis, you're welcome to address committee if you wish. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Uh, I don't, not totally sure if Mr. Pravis is going to be joining or how he'll work this, but uh, we just wanted to speak to the secondary suites uh, regulations that are that are on the agenda today. Um, I'm assuming everyone's read the report and is aware of what's going on, but we just wanted to give a bit of background. Also, clarify a few things within the report. There was um, there's a couple, just it's not the administration is necessary necessarily concerned, but there's a couple of uh, items in there that, that uh, we felt needed clarification on on this request. So uh, again, just introductions, I'm Scott Ross with Kiewitz Engineering. We have a, I'm representing Build uh, uh, Grand Prix DP in this uh, particular situation. So uh, we, we were requested a while back to put together a proposal for, uh, uh, to do with secondary suites, mostly as in response to demand that, that uh, came about through, through Builders and, and um, developers within the city and region. Uh, that demand uh, was noted. We were requested to come forth with and consider input from from Build uh, Alberta, from Build Grand Prairie uh, administration and, and council. So we actually had a meeting. Uh, you mostly may recall we we uh, set up a workshop with the council, um, and then also had follow up meetings with uh, administration. So. Um, director level like Brian Glavin, uh, Joe Johnson, uh, and, and whatnot to, to address these things. So the things we considered in that were, were one of them was the MDP policy. So uh, that's also noted in one in your report as well. But um, reports or discussions in the MDP about supporting secondary suites and whatnot and considerations to on-site parking uh, and supporting secondary suites in, in a, uh, through the application of smart growth principles an adequate supply of rental accommodations in different socioeconomic groups as a means of providing consumer choice and affordable housing options. So basically come forth with something that, that meets the demand of the MDP and can still potentially uh, work for industry. Uh, so we did that uh, after some discussion. It's been a fairly lengthy process. I think we're definitely in excess of a year here working on this. So um, we, we came up with what we would we were reviewing everything with what we would call exception lots. So basically additional lots to the current secondary suites bylaw. And essentially at, at this stage, the, uh, the stance of administration is that the secondary suites bylaw is working. So, uh, and that it's, it's not causing any problems. It's the stance of industry is that probably we could handle a few more and, and not still not cause problems. So, uh, so we did review all of the, all the different uh, regulations and whatnot to see whether uh, how we could do that and still uh, not upset the apple cart with uh, with the administrative process. So, so essentially, with with this, we came up with this exception lot. So, currently, we've got the 50 meter radius that goes around the uh, uh, around lot that administration deals with and uh, permitting. Uh, we wanted to add to that, and and from from the discussions, this basically uh, the, the areas that we could increase secondary suites was mostly to do with. Um, you know, municipal reserve across the street. So it's, it's mostly to do with parking, but um, adjacent to MRs, ponds, planting lots, public utility lots, things like that across the street from from uh, uh, what would be proposed as a secondary. And the theory was, you know, we, we can handle three within 50 meters currently, but if there's a storm pond across the street or a park or whatever it is, then there's more parking, more availability, and, and we could potentially handle more. So the... The insert that we uh, that we wrote or the amendment to the, the proposal that we wrote is concluded in a package of 57.3.1 would be the amendment to the to the bylaw. In our opinion, it provides a solution uh, proposed by industry to accommodate market demand and stimulate the economic development and growth in a manner that complies with the MDP 
and also maintain neighborhood integrity, which is one of the policies within the MVP. We also, it also does limit the growth areas to locations that we had discussions with council and with administration. Uh, so that's important to us as well. And then uh, uh, and it does comply with 6.11, which is, which recognizes parking as a, as a critical factor, 6.16, 6, sorry, out of the MDB. Um, we also wanted it to be very simple to administer. Uh, we didn't want to have a, a bunch of time and tasks and whatnot to administration. So in adding this second type of secondary suite, essentially we, uh, we did have discussions with administration and, and it's addition of a layer in the GIS system. So, um, so we don't think that's an overly difficult thing. We tried to be as clear as we could with the restrictions that were provided by administration. So, um, so basically, if you look at your uh, package, the proposal that's in there, um, we are talking about adding these suites to those locations in those areas. Essentially, if the lot's a corner lot, we would be allowed to add an additional two suites within that 50 meter radius. Uh, if the lot frontage is across from a utility lot, a municipal reserve, storm bond, or other public space that's not occupied by residents, so meaning there's no driveways across the street from these from these lots. Um, or if it's directly across from medium density or high density commercial or industrial, which provides the same kind of parking leniencies as does uh, municipal reserve and whatnot. Or it's across from, uh, not directly across from residential driveways, so essentially uh, flanking lots. So you've got a side yard across the street from you, you've got quite a bit more parking available. So, so that's the proposal that we are bringing forward. We believe that it achieves the goals of industry and administration. Uh, while considering and, and remediating any concerns such as park, parking and neighborhood integrity. This also stimulates growth and development within the city um, while meeting the current socioeconomic gap in, in supply. So a couple of things that we, uh, just from a secondary speech perspective, um, there's, there's always a, all the larger umbrella documents such as the IDP, MDP, continually talk about density and the ability to densify your city effectively through smart growth and whatnot. So this, these reduce urban sprawl, they increase assessments, um, they decrease maintenance costs, and they promote diversity. So they, they, aside from, you know, obviously we don't want to get to a point where we have too many, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute, but, um, but aside from that, we, we sh our theory is we should be, uh, should be trying as hard as we can to get as many as possible. Uh, there's an obvious demand out there for them right now. Um, the administrative report that came in, just wanted to clarify a couple of things. So uh, there's a talk of kind of how they modeled things within that report. And so within that, uh, Mr. Johnson's laid out four neighborhoods, O'Brien Lake, Northridge, Signature Falls, and Mission. So I understand how this came about, but there were basically, he modeled the neighborhoods to maximize the amount of secondary suites within there. So. For example, O'Brien Lake was modeled with 67 secondary suites in it. Actual, currently today, there's five. So we're not getting to those numbers. So um, Northridge, same thing, 36 in the model, 26 actual. Signature Falls, 62 model, nine actual. Uh, Mission Heights, which is an existing older neighborhood. So unless people decide to convert their units, um, there wouldn't be any more. 104 in the model, three actual. So the overall, the overall uh, directive here with the model was that we were we were looking at what the increase is going to be. But one of the concerns that we have as industry is that we're not getting to the numbers that council thinks we're getting to. Um, in most of these meetings, we talk about 20% being the target value for um, for these suites to be um, in those four model neighborhoods the actual percentage if you figure it out is 2.9 so we're we could have 10 times more of that and still fall within the, the regulation so and that's just natural market demand so I don't think we're seeing the uptake that we that we are expecting um, and and the tendency is to kind of look at a couple neighborhoods and West Point being one of them and I can show that on my screen here in a minute if you want but we're not getting to that 20%, I guess, is the point. So we did a ton of work in the background here on these uh, on these demands. I don't know if I can share my screen or not. <laughs> I can certainly try. 
And you should be able to, if you catch it right now, give it a second and you'll definitely be able to in a sec or two. Here. I think I can. So... Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. So, okay, now i got to figure out what you're seeing. <laughs> so we see, a t we see a table of different neighborhoods with a number of secondary suites in them. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, so the, uh, the suites here, so this is an example of the actual suites that, that are available within the area. So what we did is we looked at basically every new neighborhood in the city of Grand Prairie. Um, so the number of secondary suites, uh, we had 51 of them. There's a, there's a, so there's a top, but we looked at a total of 10,000 lots. So probably talking in an area of like 30,000 in population. So probably half the city. The actual existing secondary suites that, that are out there today works out to about 4.99%. So you'll see in this chart that um, there is, there are a lot of neighborhoods that are extremely low. Um, and most of them are somewhat existing, fully built out uh, Mission Heights and whatnot. So the only neighborhood that gets to the to council's target of 20% is West Point. And it actually, so we, we tried to figure out where the problems were. So we looked at kind of the, like these four red, um, four red highlighted areas are kind of the more, um, what we considered the, the most dense areas. And we actually took specific areas and looked at them. So, um, so I'll show you a couple maps here in a minute, but there's localized areas in West Point that have 65% of the units have secondary suites. Uh, Northridge is 43, Crystal Landing is 87, um, Countryside North is 36. So if we, if we applied the current uh, secondary suites bylaw to them, uh, those numbers drop dramatically. So if basically what I'm saying is those areas are not actually allowed to, they wouldn't be allowed to develop the way they are today. So if we reduce them uh, to the 20% maximum, the number we would end up with is, is uh, highlighted here on the right. And the actual uptake of secondary suites would drop to 3.5%. So we're nowhere near the 20. Um, like the, so the examples that we, uh, that we looked at, and here's a couple um, of the neighborhoods. So this is the dispersion of, of secondaries within these neighborhoods. So, so a couple of them is a good example of something that's, this is what you would get with the current the current bylaw. So with not all of them, but for the most part, spread out fairly sparse and whatnot. Uh, we also have, um, we have countryside north here that we looked at. It was a little bit dense in locations, uh, but the problem, uh, you know, crystal landing, and I don't believe they get many calls and whatnot about this one, but uh, Northridge. So this was used as an example as, of something that uh, in the report is, is something that, that has a fairly high uptake and it, and it does, um, you know, so, but most of these areas, any of these areas highlighted in red wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to develop that way today. West Point is the example everyone likes to use. This is why we have a problem. So um, if you look at that table, I mean, basically every single lot out there in the last two phases of development are secondary. There was no restrictions on secondaries at the time that was developed and you're getting up in the range of 65 percent, uh, which is, and, and to be honest, I mean, that's only because there's outside blocks that didn't have secondaries on them. So uh, basically 100 percent uptake in secondaries. So this can never happen. Now. This is not a, not something that can occur today. Um, based on the, uh, based on the current bylaw, you're going to get about a quarter of that at the absolute most. So um we looked at the, the, the percent increase based on the proposal that we have provided. So uh, when you look at the, the suites that are in there, uh, Mr. Johnson's report talks about modeling showing an increase of 36 to 61 percent uh, on secondary suites. It's, it's actually, so, so I just don't want that number to scare people. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, we're going from the model that, that of those four neighborhoods I just did the math here yesterday, and the model for those neighborhoods, we're getting about 17 to 18% of secondary suites within those neighborhoods. Now, uh, with, with the proposal that we've provided and using Joe's numbers, and keep in mind, this is in an absolute perfect scenario where you can hand pick the lots that apply for secondary suites. Uh, we're going from 18% up to about 25 the range is, is in that zone. And it's actually pretty tight. So you'll see that in your report. Uh, it does show that in, in that little table. So I, uh, to me, the value in that report is the second last column 
uh, which talks about the um, which table is that? I think it's on the second or third page of your or your second page of your report there. So the total lots plus second contingent secondary suites. Uh, so you'll see the numbers ranging from 24.2 to 27.1. So that would be the total overall uptake in the neighborhood if if we scripted it perfectly. Um, which so so it's a hair above the intended 20% that council has, but we haven't seen any neighborhood get to 20% under the current regulations. So um, so we did look at that. Um, most of the rates, like you said, right now are less than five. Uh, and then surrounding municipalities, I know we looked at, uh, Mr. Johnson looked at the, the uh, County Grand Prairie and Sexsmith as uh, adjacent municipalities. We did a lot of work in the background. I'd be happy to share if you want. I'm not gonna get into detail, but around uh, other cities in the province. So, uh, and how they handle things and, and whatnot. Um, a couple of highlights, Red Deer is actually very similar to what we proposed. I had a, a bit of a chuckle last night reading all these things that Red Deer does exactly this. Um, they allow up to a maximum of 15% of, of the neighborhood, but it's, uh, it's all based on parking uh, adjacent to the secondary street. So municipal reserves, ponds, things like that, um, but based on an overall percentage. So, and same thing with the, uh, Edmonton actually just recently removed all restrictions on secondary suites. So if it's allowed in the zoning, there's no restriction on spacing. Um, I looked at Lethbridge and a few others as well, but, um, but basically out of today, what we are hoping to get, uh, because we've been working on this for some time, it's we've got a wealth of data here uh, that uh, research has been done. Uh, we would appreciate committee not simply accepting this report uh, for information. We'd like some movement on it, whether whichever whatever direction that is. Uh, so if if that means that uh, we have if there are any questions or whatever not uh, with that, I would definitely like to clear them up now before we get into the actual meat of the meeting. So I don't know if Scott has anything he wants to add or not, but. Um, Mr. Provitz, if yeah, if Mr. Provitz, if you'd like to speak to this, now's your chance. Okay, perfect. Thanks, uh, Mr. Bressy. Um, I do want to, I guess, reiterate um, the fact that we had worked on this. Uh, I think it was 2010. Uh, the prior. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Okay, uh, the prior council, we worked on this, so I'm, I was just thinking back, it was probably just Bill and Jackie that, uh, that participated in that at the time. And the council at the time said they felt comfortable with uh, no more than 20% uh, secondary suites in, in neighborhoods or subdivisions. And so that's where the modeling came from, from the uh, 50 meter radius and all the other rules that came into effect. It was we kind of joke it's the, the West Point rule. Um, and like uh, Mr. Rossler said that that won't happen again with the new uh, regulations that, that have been put in place. So I guess the, the point being is that that 20% was the kind of where everything, all the uh, rules and regulations um, were trying to achieve. But as you see by those charts and graphs that were nowhere near that. So we were just hoping, like we had put together a proposal that is in your package and to, I guess, reiterate what uh, what Scott said is that we're hoping that um, that this committee or, or, or whoever has to to accept this, but to move this, uh, this proposal ahead. Thank you. Well, th thank you for, pres for presenting to us. Thank you for sharing your perspectives and some information with us. Uh, just look into council and committee. I see Bl Councillor Blackburn would like to ask a question and then Councillor Thiessen would. And just a reminder that we're going to have an administrative report that's an agenda item later. So now's a great chance to ask questions of Mr. Spravitz and Rossler, but I don't want us to enter debate at this point. So Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bressy. I guess the, the question I have for either uh, Mr. Pravitz or Mr. Rossler is, um, do you have a sense of what the market demand is for uh, additional 
um, secondary suites that, uh, that kind of drives the recommendation that you've made? Uh, it's, that would be hard to put a, an actual figure to. This came to our attention. Again, I probably should have said who I was, but I'm the chair of Build Grand Prairie. Um, and so we have most, uh, if not all, builders that are, are part of our association. This came up about two years ago, um, saying from our members, our builder members, saying that there is a, a demand for this product. Now, to put a figure to that, I think that would be difficult. Um, the one thing that the builders are saying to us that, you know, with the way that the, the mortgage uh, rules have changed, trying to get into a new home, it just it, it's opening up more of a market for for portability. Somebody a first time buyer to be able to offset their their mortgage um, is is a real good thing right now for for the the economy that we're in. But as far as to put a figure, I I I, I don't know what what that uptake. It might be that might you know be a question to uh, the real estate community. Thank you. And I, I wasn't really looking for a number, just just a sense of whether or not the the, uh, the demand is there to create as many suites as this this proposal would uh, would allow for. Yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Bressy. Uh, this is for either Scott. Uh, just a question uh, in regards to vacancy rates. That's something that I don't see in the report. I understand there's a market for this and for home, first time home, homeowners. Uh, CMHC also has a pretty good plan to uh, where you don't have to pay them back until you sell your home or you live into it for a while and then you actually get like the free money up to, I think it's $40,000 uh, for a first time homeowner. Um, are you guys aware of what the vacancy rates are currently in Grand Prairie? I'm hearing lots from different apartment complexes that uh, that their vacancy rates are are pretty high at this time. Yeah, I I guess I can answer that. Um, I've I've heard very varying reports. I've heard as high as 18, 19 percent, and I've heard as low as two percent. So my best guess, and you probably pick somewhere in in the middle. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, like 12 to 15% vacancy. Well, thanks for that answer. Great. Is there any other questions for the delegation? Great. Well, gentlemen, thanks uh, again for coming. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for waiting for us, and thanks for speaking to it. To it. Really appreciate it. I'd ask you to turn off your cameras just to kind of leave the table, so to speak, but you're more than welcome to stick around and hear the, re and hear the rest of the meeting. And, yeah, you're more than welcome to observe the rest of the meeting. But thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And with that, we'll move on to item 1.1, which is Director Service Area Update, and that is Director Glavin. Thank you, Mr. Jesse. We'll start off with economic development. Uh, to date, the Economic Recovery Grant Program has issued 13 marketing grants worth $35,400 with a total project value of $91,500. As well, we've issued seven beautification grants worth $108,000 uh, with total project values of uh, over 485,000. Uh, we have received some statistics from the chamber on the Get in the Loop program. Uh, as of earlier this week, uh, there have been 1,600 downloads of the app. They currently have 14 local partners and four national partners. Uh, last week, they began radio and digital uh, billboard campaigns targeting business signups and uh, promoting the three months free. Uh, and that three months free was thanks to the economic recovery grant that they received. Uh, for Small Business Week, our economic development team, some members of senior administration and council uh, did a small business walk um, visiting over 160 businesses. Um, that we had uh, lots of positive feedback and uh, I'd like to thank council for taking time to join us on those. Uh, as well for the Business Resiliency Task Force, uh, earlier this year, they received funding to do a cohort of 10 businesses to receive uh, digital marketing training. They've just received additional money to do uh, 20 more businesses uh, and uh, just received that uh, go ahead this morning to release that information. So they'll be uh, uh, tracking those businesses into the program. 
In engineering, we posted the 2021 slope repair program uh, RFP. Uh, as well with the uh, construction season winding up here, we have a couple projects that are uh, close to being done on uh, 68th Avenue and Resources Road, uh, as well as uh, 108th Street north of 84th Avenue, which just opened up to two-way traffic again this morning, and that uh, project is nearing completion. Uh, there was a substantial amount of work that was completed this year, and uh, planning is well underway for 2021. Uh, and uh, we're close to having some of those tenders ready to go out for uh, next season. In transportation, our signals group is working on winterizing uh, our cabinets, uh, as well as have installed the final radar speed signs from the initial six that uh, we uh, received. Uh, we have two currently in the Swanhaven School Zone, uh, two along 100th Avenue uh, near the Bear, Pe uh, Bear Creek Bridge on either side, one unit entering the Harry Balfour School Zone on 108th Avenue eastbound, uh, and just installed the last one on 99th Avenue east of 105th Street. Uh, for as well in signs, <coughs> we've concluded our line painting program, <coughs> excuse me, with an estimated uh, 278 kilometers of paint, uh, line painting that we've done over the summer. Uh, as well, we're working on some sign replacements replacements right now that includes uh, four additional stop to yield conversions uh, that we've assessed those intersections that it's safe to do so. In uh, transportation, uh, we are completing some repairs on a washout that occurred earlier this year on Range Road 71 at Hockey Estates that should be completed by the end of the day if all goes well. Uh, finishing up a few uh, minor road projects here and there on, on the transportation side and we're all set for the winter season. Uh, in parks, uh, tree planting is completed for this year. We've uh, planted over 500 trees throughout the city. Uh, city skating rinks are being built and applications for neighborhood rinks are coming in. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you, Director Glavin. Are there any questions? All right. It looks like you're... Oh, Councillor Tyson just was about to let him off the hook. Oh, I beat the buzzer. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Uh, Director Glavin, uh, just a question in regards to uh, road construction projects. Um, if they can't close close up those uh, those roads, what's our plan moving forward with uh, with our construction companies to ensure that the work gets done or that traffic can move safely through the city at the various locations where they're still working on it? Yeah, right now, uh, we don't believe there's a risk of the city construction projects uh, not completing at this time. They're very near completion right now with paving. Um, there's one project that Aquaterra is uh -huh. track on 84th Avenue and 116th Street. My understanding this morning is they've begun doing some of the backfilling on one of the uh, uh, pits that they were using. Uh, and they do anticipate having that road completed by early next week. Uh, should they not be able to get uh, paving done with hot mix, the intent is to put cold mix down for the winter, uh, and that would be their responsibility to maintain the quality of that road for the duration of the winter. We would continue doing our snow removal operations on it, uh, but the intent is to have those lanes open with a hard surface. Hey, beautiful. I'm glad you mentioned 84th and, uh, and 116th because that's the one that I'm most worried about. But appreciate that. Thank you, Brian. Great. Are there any other questions for Director Glavin? Great. Well, then with that, uh, let's go easy on him before we hit real snow removal season and we get contentious maybe. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to item 1.2, and that is downtown sports for, through phase four and Miss Lee. Uh, thank you, Chair Bressy. At the September 29th Infrastructure and Economic Development uh, Committee meeting, um, administration received direction to bring back to council a plan for right. the fall budget deliberations that include economic support for downtown businesses affected by phase four, including marketing opportunities, parking, additional beautification, and any other opportunities identified by administration. Um, in response to this direction, we've had um, a number of commerce conversations, both internally with um, multiple departments across the organization, as well as with um, Wendy Bosch from the Downtown Association and a number of downtown business owners. 
Um, today, I'm happy to bring forward uh, a couple of recommendations that we feel uh, address a number of the concerns uh, from the businesses within the impacted area. Um, speaking specifically to some of the items within the original motion, in terms of marketing and communication, um, this year the Downtown Association is very well positioned to support businesses through phase four of construction. Um, they are taking a new approach to their communication strategy and really looking for ways to uh, encourage residents and shoppers to come down to the downtown core through the use of programming and events. So sort of shifting the focus rather than um, marketing that you are able to come downtown, marketing while you should want to, and creating additional opportunities and excitement. Um, they have a number of events that they are hoping to host this year, uh, such as night markets, food truck festivals. Um, they've seen some really great success through their um, buskers program and having live entertainment, so they're hoping to expand upon that and tie it into um, their broader communication. Um, Wendy is very... Uh, uh, enthusiastic and passionate, and she's got a, a lot of great ideas. I know she's talked a lot about really leaning into the construction theme um, with sort of a, a Bob the Builder type theme throughout their communication. So rather than uh, avoiding construction, leaning into it and making it part of their overall programming. So with that in mind, our recommendation is uh, to award a grant uh, directly to the Downtown Association that would allow them to enact a number of these strategies. Um, a brief breakdown of the recommended grant amount has been provided under the budget and financial implications section, uh, totaling $90,000. And that would be uh, strictly for the use of the Downtown Association to um, carry out their marketing strategies. This would allow city uh, staff and administration to focus on communicating more of the uh, construction impacts, transportation, um, and, and um, project impacts. Um, and allow the downtown to sort of focus on, on the marketing and, and attraction of, of customers and, and residents. Um, in addition, the, oh, excuse me, um, one of the key pieces of this is building, is the intent to build upon some of the excess from the Art in the Alley program that was run um, for phases, um, uh, or previous phases. Um, through that program, $14,000 was awarded to six mural projects, uh, one of which is just uh, very newly being completed or recently completed, and it's very impressive and has got a lot of attention from the public. Um, the 14500 was awarded to six mural projects. The remaining funds were used for a protective coating to help protect uh, the, the murals from uh, graffiti. Um, and then we also actually saw the program take on a little bit of a life of its own and saw an additional three murals that were uh, created in the downtown as um, both thank yous from the artists, and thank yous to the Downtown Association and due to private investment from business owners. Um, in terms of parking, uh, city administration is currently working internally, so discussions are ongoing with City on 99. Uh, we have committed to freeing up a number of spaces within the City on 99 parking for use by uh, customers in the adjacent buildings. Um, and then additionally, engineering and transportation are currently working to look at um, alternative parking arrangements along 99th Street, um, potentially angled parking or other um, arrangements which still need to be sort of fine-tuned, taking into consideration some of the turning, uh, turning widths required for access to the alleys. Uh, but that is something that we have committed to and are moving forward on. Um, now we're just down to the fine-tuning exactly how many stalls we can, can fit in on either side of 100 out there. Um, and then additionally, alley maintenance, transportation, um, typically the back alleys um, across the city, but also within the downtown, are prioritized after main roadways, uh, recognizing the um, increased impacts that downtown construction will have on the alleys adjacent to 100 Ave. Uh, transportation will be prioritizing those alleys first um, first thing in the in the spring season, um, doing um, a sweep through and a patch and maintenance to ensure that um, it, is, it is accessible for businesses and customers accessing the businesses downtown. Um, speaking with Mr. Carroll, he was planning on getting out uh, later this week as well just to do another sweeping before the snow hits and then we'll be out again um, as soon as they're able early in the spring there. 
Um, and then finally, around the beautification and facade improvements. Um, while the contractor and project team are working, excuse me, while the project team is working closely with the contractor to ensure that front access is maintained throughout the duration of the project, uh, we do recognize that this will put an increased uh, emphasis on back alley access for our downtown businesses. Um, so recognizing that as well as um, uh, the letter received from the Downtown Association, which should be included in uh, committee's agenda package today, uh, we are recommending the reintrodu reintroduction of the facade improvement grant within the Downtown Incentives Program. Uh, this was previously suspended um, after the 2018 year. So for 2019 on, the facade improvement grant was uh, specifically was suspended while the other grant opportunities within Downtown Incentives were maintained. Um, administration is proposing that we reintroduce the facade improvement grant for the entire program area that is encompassed within the downtown incentives program. Um, just to provide some clarity, the program area as referenced within the report refers to the definition included in policy 316, uh, downtown incentives program, uh, which is an important nuance just because it is expanded beyond the traditional definition of the downtown, which would be found through the business improvement area bylaw or the land use bylaw through the CC district. So it has been expanded slightly to the north and the south. Uh, the recommendation in reintroducing the facade improvement grant to the entire downtown area is recognizing uh, the impacts that not just the businesses along 100 Ave will be experiencing as a result of construction and recognizing it as an opportunity to encourage business owners across the area to uh, in invest in their properties and take advantage of some of these uh, funding during this scenario. The second piece to that recommendation is recognizing the increased uh, impact on back alleys and some of the um, improvements that may be required in order to ensure accessibility and safety, um, but also signage and visibility. We are recommending, administration is recommending that the facade improvement grant be open to improvements for back alley access uh, for those businesses directly impacted by phase four construction. So those would be um, the businesses uh, directly fronting onto 100 Ave. The reason we have um, made the re recommendation to limit this aspect of the facade improvement program uh, is that um, we recognize that it may not directly support the intent of the overall sort of uh, facade improvement grant, as these may be sort of seen as more temporary or short-term um, improvements that may not um, improve to the overall visibility and aesthetic of, of the downtown, um, but more of a means to help support businesses in um, ensuring that they're their customers are able to access their doors. Um, currently within the facade improvement program, um, back alley entrances are specifically uh, excluded from the program, just recognizing the original intent of the program. Um, as I mentioned previously, a budget uh, over uh, a broad budget has been provided uh, based on the $90,000 grant uh, recommendation. Uh, this was based on conversations with the Downtown Association and um, some commonly agreed upon budget items, uh, but we do recommend maintaining some flexibility within those amounts in order to allow them to um, effectively utilize the funding. Uh, additionally, City Communications has identified a $70,000 budget that will be used specifically for uh, things such as signage and banners, which were implemented in the phase three, uh, as well as some of the activities of our business ambassador position, um, allowing him to buy, you know, take business owners out for coffee and those types of things, more of an ambassador outreach type program. Um, staffing costs and, and salaries are, will be covered within um, individual budget operating, or excuse me, individual department operating budgets. Uh, with that, I will take any questions. Great, uh, thank you for the work you're putting into keeping our downtown core going through constructions. Uh, I see, uh, are there any questions that committee has? Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Chair Brassi. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lee, for, for your report and for your recommendations. Uh, just a question. Uh, actually, I got a couple. 
Uh, one is just a point of clarity. Um, so the two hundred thousand dollars for the facade improvement is that the total budget or the total per project? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Councillor Thiessen. Um, the two hundred thousand dollar proposed cap would be the total budget available for facade improvement grants specifically. Uh, currently, there is five hundred and forty thousand dollars available within the downtown incentives program. The intention with uh, recommending a cap is to mitigate any um, uncertainty uh, for the urban residential grant, uh, recognizing that we are balancing two priority areas within this program and the urban residential grant we've been using uh, as a marketing tool um, to interact with the, the aim of attracting investment or interest in the South Montrose site. So we wanted to provide a little bit of certainty uh, through that cap that at a, min at a minimum 350000 would be available for the urban residential grant for that site uh, with any remainder not allocated to the facade improvement would be available for South Montrose. Beautiful. Thank you for that answer. Um, the other question that I had just in regards to the Downtown Association grant, I think this will be very helpful for them to help us communicate uh, phase four, as well as uh, mitigate some of their own losses, I, I would imagine, from, from losing their BIA grant uh, or BRZ grant, I think it was. Um, anyways, uh, that $90,000, uh, where is that grant money coming from? Is that part of our budget as well? Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, that is um, money that is currently available within the phase four construction project. Um, today, the recommendation today is not requesting any additional funding, um, but approval from a recommendation from count, from committee to for council to approve awarding that funding to the downtown association from the existing phase four construction budget. Okay, no, that's that's really good. Um, I guess it, you just gave me one more question, then I'll, I'll leave you alone here. Uh, great job answering. Um, what's the city's budget for advertising downtown construction currently? Like uh, ninety thousand for the downtown association coming out of budget. Uh, what's our phase four construction uh, advertisement budget? Thank you through, through the chair. City communications uh, advertising budget is seventy thousand dollars. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, just just two questions I've got, and then I'll open it to others. But just a uh, question about that seventy thousand is if I'm reading that report correctly, we're not spending an additional seventy thousand dollars on our communication department to advertise downtown that's but that's about how much staff time that we've already allocated for that we figure we'll be spending is that correct um thank you chair Bressy. uh sorry no to clarify that is a, a a direct spend it does not encompass the salary spend um and uh same as with the ninety thousand dollar grant this is money that is already allocated within the phase four and doesn't represent a, a budget increase Gotcha. And then uh, my other question was just about facade improvements. Since the city ended the grant program, are we aware of any businesses choosing to improve their facades just with their with their own capital, or have has facade improvement just stopped altogether in the downtown core, as far as we know, since we stopped the program? Uh, thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, as far as we can see through um, building permits and just sort of a survey of the streets, we found four properties that have uh, proactively invested in their um, building frontage and their facades. Uh, they range um, with some of the smaller ones simply being um, putting up new signage and a coat of paint, and then um, one larger one that was part of a, a larger building renovation, at, which encompassed the facade. Uh, but there's been four as far as we can see. Great, awesome, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Clayton, did you have a question? Thanks, Chair President. Um, in regards to the marketing grant as it's laid out there and the breakdowns, I uh, just want to uh, confirm again that um, although this is a recommendation and that the intent is to work um, you know, very succinctly with the Downtown Association, we aren't specifically saying that those amounts need to be as laid out. Um, it's more of a suggestion and a guideline. Obviously, the amount of dollars is is you know approved and final. But within the uh, grant itself, if there's a need for um, adjusting some of those buckets, is that an opportunity that the downtown association can take upon themselves? 
Uh, thank you through the chair. Yes, that is correct. Um, the budget items have been laid out more so for council's information and uh, form the basis of our conversation with the downtown association, but the intention wouldn't be for the city to uh, micromanage the grant or um, keep them from making adjustments within. There are some commonly agreed upon uh, recommendations, one of them being uh, using the funds to hire two marketing coordinators. Uh, but for example, if the downtown association is successful in uh, acquiring uh, Canada Alberta job grants or other funding, they may be able to uh, maximize those funds and use some of those elsewhere in, the, in their marketing strategy. So certainly the, the goal is to maintain flexibility for the, the association. Great. Are there any other questions or members willing to make a motion? Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Chair Bresci. Just one more question for Ms. Lee. I know I said I stopped picking on you, but uh, uh, in regards to the facade improvement grant, with those four businesses that proactively uh, renovated the exterior of their business. Um, w under the old grant guidelines, there was uh, retroactive applications that came in that we allowed for some. Would these businesses uh, currently be eligible as they were in the past to retroactively apply for the facade improvement grant? Thank you, through the chair. Uh, the previous retroactive facade improvement grant was very specifically uh, written into the policy with specific dates and timelines. Upon subsequent revisions of the policy, that section was removed. Um, that certainly would be within the latitude of, of council to direct administration to amend the policy, uh, but would require council direction. Okay, thank you. Great, uh, Councillor Clayton. Uh, um Thanks, Chair Bressy. Another question for uh, Ms. Lee. Can you uh, tell me, is there um, a reason to keep uh, the current uh, pro uh, downtown incentive program that you're trying to bring back and the patio portion of it uh, as individual buckets when in turn we have another um, funding source that's available for outside of just downtown that is um, facade improvement and patio? And so um, I'm just wondering, you know, in, in in the spirit of reducing red tape, would there be value in having both buckets uh, or grants, I guess, rather, um, succinct? So there's one that is facade and grants that's available for people outside of downtown and one that's for, so for, for facade and patios in the downtown core. Is there a reason to sort of have so many different grant applications? Uh, thank you, through the chair. Uh, that is uh, a valid point. Initially, when the patio grant was designed, it was uh, designed with the intent to leverage the existing program with the downtown association. I'm not sure if anybody remembers the wooden patios that were outside of Laurels and I believe Tito's. Uh, so that was what was um, in mind when we initially designed the program, uh, which is where we came up with that smaller cap. It allowed businesses to put in um, patios outside of their, their front without requiring additional um, design guidelines to be met. Uh, the result has been, uh, hasn't been quite as we expected. We have seen a few uh, patio projects come through under the facade uh, program. For example, Earl's uh, was approved for their patio uh, as their patio encompasses the entire facade and they very easily meet uh, five of the design guidelines. Uh, so there is an opportunity to um, cover patios within the facade program, provided they meet the minimum requirements in terms of lighting and accessibility and greenery and, and those other design guidelines. Um, the only reason that I could see keeping the facade, or excuse me, the patio uh, separate is in the event that uh, a business is looking to put in a more simple version of a patio, such as the one that was at Laurel. Um, however, that is, is not not an, a necessity and uh, administ we would be open to amending it to align with the beautification and patio grant, which is currently under the economic recovery um, program and was a result of input from our advisory committee there. Great, uh, one last question I got about the patio, gr the patio grant is, does it allow for rooftop patios or is it just street front, front patios? Uh, it would depend on the, 
um, on the, the rooftop patio. So it must be uh, patios that are open to um, customers in public. Uh, so for example, it wouldn't be approved for rooftop if it were for a private apartment building in the downtown or had a very restricted uh, use. Um, a restaurant or another business where they have people coming in and they're looking for opportunities to expand their uh, capacity, it would uh, be eligible under the facade, or excuse me, the patio ground. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm, if there are other questions, by all means ask them, but also I'm wondering if somebody would be willing to make a motion. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Chair Presley, for recognizing me. Uh, I would move that the committee recommend council approve granting $90,000 from the Phase 4 Downtown Rehabilitation Streetscape Project budget to the Downtown Association to support their marketing and communication strategy. Now, based off of a question from Councillor Clayton earlier, I imagine this might be amended or or some other motion might come out of it. Uh, I just... Uh, well, I, I would encourage a committee to support this and send this to council so we can have this discussion. Uh, the Downtown Association is, uh, is a great partner in the city of Grand Prairie. And, um, you know, I just want to recognize that uh, one of the biggest issues that our downtown businesses are facing is um, the ability to communicate to the general public that their businesses are still open, especially when that front street is likely going to be closed for the duration of the summer. Um, so to get them going down the alleyways to to see that level of beautification that's happening uh, sort of in the shadows of our alleys and, uh, you know, give people a new walking path, add more life to the downtown core, and um, not try to take everything on ourselves. I know a lot of times as a big organization, we can throw a bunch of money at marketing and advertising. And I could say, you know, we could use that 90000 instead of the 70000 that we already have in our budget. But uh, I think this would also enable the downtown association to be target specific on the businesses that they are, are directly influenced and influencing by. I, I don't know how I was going to say that, but I think it's it's great that we the more people that we have communicating this message and we can streamline that funding specific to the downtown association, I think will only benefit our downtown businesses. So I would encourage committee to at least send this forward to council and we can have a robust uh, debate if we want to change the numbers there. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anybody that would like to speak to this motion? In that case, I will call it to question. All in favor? And that motion passes committee unanimously. As there's another recommendation, is anybody willing to make a second motion? Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Chair Brassi. I'll willing to do both. So I move that committee recommend council approve opening applications for the facade improvement grant under the downtown incentives policy to a maximum total amount of $200,000 within the existing program boundary and to amend the program to allow grant funding to be used for back alley improvements for those businesses directly impacted by phase four construction effective from the time of approval until phase four construction completion. Great. Uh, thank, thank you. Is there any questions or debate on that on the, on that motion? So what I will say is I 100% support this day sending it to council. I'm I honestly don't know where I am with facade improvement. Just given that we do have a wider facade improvement program available to the whole community right now, but also my hope with facade improvement was that we'd spice up some buildings and then there would be people that. More, but then that would create momentum in the downtown core and others would look and say, oh, I'm not looking good next to the neighbors. I need to invest my private money into investing it. My idea with sod improvement is I like that the, I'm okay with the taxpayers getting, helping get momentum going and making the downtown core better. I I think it's better for taxpayers though, if they just get the momentum going and they're, and they don't continue participating. And it looks like we've had some businesses go ahead and continue that momentum without without us. So I'm likely to support this. I'm definitely going to support it today. I'm likely to support it if this gets to council, but I'm having some doubts on that. Mm -hmm. Councilor Thiessen. Thank you very much. And thanks for your comments, uh, Chair Bressy. Um, I. I don't know. I kind of I kind of look at the, the downtown core of any city being that uh, that level of uh, attractability that draws people into a more community centered, um, mobile, like active, active transportation uh, path. Um, I think we're on a good road here. And I know I fought against a lot of the costs and, and expenses that we put into the downtown. But at this point, um, I could see so many things happening with the facade improvement. It was good to hear that it's not going to directly impact 
the back alleys because we want that frontage. Uh, we want to draw people in as they drive through downtown that they know they're driving through downtown. And I'm glad that you mentioned that those four other businesses did did uh, you know proactively take it upon themselves to improve their property based off of their their neighbors' improvements. Um, uh, this is just a small, small dip in the bucket, I think, and uh, it's a nice tip of the hat uh, to our businesses who have had to endure a lot over the course of the past four years, especially in regards to construction and closing their businesses down. So, um, yeah, um, I don't think I have to convince anybody to send this to council, but uh, for any council member who's listening, I'd like to encourage you to definitely give it a hard, hard look and a thought and consider what kind of character we want our downtown to be and how we can... Uh, help facilitate that character through, uh, you know, the incentives that we can give our businesses downtown and keep that momentum going afterwards, especially coming out of COVID and a time where, you know, our local and small businesses have been dramatically impacted by the effects of lockdown and all that other stuff. So I encourage the Senate Council and I uh, encourage all council members to give it a good hard thought uh, what kind of character we want to see our downtown streetscape look like, especially with our business frontages uh, in the future next Monday. Thanks. Mayor Given. Yeah, just really briefly, Councillor Bressy, uh, you know, so I, when it gets to council, I won't have to say, you know, I think I look at this as um, while downtown businesses could apply for the larger program, this I think uh, this ensures that there is a specific amount of money that only they can apply for. Um, and, you know, so, you know, I think that's the slight differentiation there. I know that's not your larger issue that you're saying, you know, the hope would be that it would carry on um, through strictly private investment. I think that would be the hope too in any non-COVID year. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I really see this, you know, one, uh, we're segmenting some money that is applicable only to downtown area businesses with specific intent recognizing the renovation uh, will be going on. And then the second bit is, I really see this as economic stimulus as well. Um, this is something specific that we can do uh, that will engage a different type of business than the city's other capital plans. You know, we had a big conversation about how much we're spending on asphalt uh, in the coming year as economic stimulus, and, and that's a relevant and important conversation. Um, but this specific amount of money uh, we have seen will be utilized by downtown businesses and really engages different types of, of contractors and businesses than the city's overall sort of capital stimulus plan will. So I sort of, you know, it's um, it serves a whole bunch of different intents and that's why I think it's worthy of supporting. Great. Uh, Councillor Plot. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. Sorry, I had to do a venue change quick meeting there. Um, I, uh, I won't be supporting this when it comes to council and I was one of the uh, the buildings downtown that did a substantial improvement, and I, like Councillor Bressy, thought the city did a lot to get this started. We've given downtown four or five years now of funding to get them started, and so I just want to remind you that's still two hundred and fifty thousand or two hundred thousand dollars that could be going to help other areas of the community, not just downtown. We just started an intake program through economic development that you guys are aware of. We're just starting to get applications that's getting funded. But we just gave those people the chance to start getting funding together. For you guys that have tried to put a program in for this, it's a fair amount of work. You have to put some thought in, you have to get some design, you have to use consulting. And the downtown owners have known about this for four or five years. So if they've been really wanting to do an improvement by this point, I would surely have hoped they did. And so for me, I just, I can't keep supporting downtown only incentives. I'm, I, I'm all about the marketing, fine, but downtown only incentives for facades They've had their kick at the can for four years now. Sorry for the downtown owners, but I get too much feedback from other areas of the community to remind us they need funding as well. So I won't see Peter Morgan this at all when it comes to council. Great. Thank you. Is there any other conversation? Would you like to close, Councillor Thiessen, if not? I don't see anybody else, and I see you shaking your head. So in that case, I think we're ready to call it to questions. So all in favor? And this will be coming to council that passes unanimously. And is there any other business anybody would like to do on this agenda item? Great, then I will move on to item 1.3, which is secondary suites regulations. And it's Mr. Johnson presenting the report, but Director Glavin told me that he'd like the opportunity to introduce it. So Director Glavin. Thank you, for, uh, Chair Rusty. Yeah, I just wanted to give a brief uh, preamble to the report. Uh, as a recap that we uh, brought this forward on September 1st with a recommendation to review the proposal by build. At that committee meeting, uh, meeting we did receive that direction to review the proposal. 
Uh, but uh, specifically in the discussion for that proposal, we were told not to bring back a recommendation to this meeting, but just the information that was requested. Uh, and I see uh, with delegations were aligned with the desire to uh, have some direction from council on this. So uh, what we're looking for is to receive direction from council to um, bring back these amendments to council. Um, should council choose to uh, look at increasing the density and we'd appreciate some guidance on any expectations that council may have for public uh, engagement. And with that, I'll leave it to Mr. Johnson. Great, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bressy. I have the luxury of being last on a very lengthy agenda, so I'll try and keep my presentation relatively brief. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, just one moment. <clears throat> All right. We can see it now. Uh, okay, excellent, thank you. Okay, so I'm just basically walking through the report, uh, dissecting the me uh, motion piece by piece. So this is the, commo uh, the motion that was made at committee on September 1st. I won't read it out loud, but uh, again, going through it piece by piece, the, um, The review of the proposed amendments to the secondary suites regulations proposed by Build Grand Prairie inclusive comparable to the existing municipal or existing regulations. So what we did as, as noted in the report is that we randomly chose a number of neighborhoods to model the existing regulations and then apply the build regulations on top of that. They are applied totally on a hypothetical basis as our delegation noted um, there is the possibility to use the regulations to maximize the output, um, and there's different strategic ways that one might be able to do that just in terms of sequencing of applications. I think that this is a reasonably balanced approach to, uh, to getting a model of how the existing regulations can be used to uh, create a distribution in the neighborhood. And then, as noted, the builds, builds proposal is then applied. What we found was a wide range, range of results ranging from 36 to 61% increase in the number of suites allowed. That's not to be confused with the overall neighborhood density. Of, uh, as our delegation noted that there was discussion about the 20% mark. This is not that same measure. This is an increase of what would be allowed under the existing regulations. And the wide range is due to the unique characteristics of each neighborhood. So. Each neighborhood has different design features with respect to corner lots, PULs, municipal reserve, and whatnot. This is the table that summarizes the uh, findings of that modeling. Uh, each neighborhood, the columns are uh, total lots in the picture that's shown, secondary suites using the existing regs, the contingency suites, which are the build proposal, and then the total number of suites the total number that those suites make out of the total lots and what percentage increase. We did uh, O'Brien Lake, the blue being the regular lots and the red being contingency, uh, Northridge, Signature Falls, and a uh, portion of Mission Heights. Again, totally hypothetical. The next part of the motion is comparing to surrounding municipalities. This was a little difficult, uh, but we did get some information for committee's consideration. Uh, for starters, no municipalities were able to provide statistical information. Wembley and Beaver Lodge do not appear to accommodate secondary suites in their land use bylaw. That's not to say that they don't happen. They likely do happen uh, in uh, an illegal or unauthorized fashion. Uh, but their, their land use bylaws don't accommodate for it. Uh, Sexsmith has a reasonable opportunity for secondary suites. And the county allows for secondary suites in one land use district. And at the time of writing the report, and, and I believe till to present right now, uh, that land use district is applied in two small areas. One is in the north end of Claremont, and one is in the southeast corner of Whispering Ridge. In discussing with county staff, the area in the southeast corner of Whispering Ridge, though uh, allowing secondary suites, currently there are none as the area has been built out with 
some form of multi, be it semi-detached or whatnot. So uh, those are the only two areas in the county that uh, allow for secondary suites. And then the final piece of the report is data since 2015 on the amount of permits pulled. So I'm gonna uh, confuse the matter a little bit from what was presented in the report. Uh, I did provide a table in the report, but upon reflection, some of that information isn't entirely uh, useful because the information in the report contains secondary suites where people were uh, auth or trying to get their previously unauthorized suites authorized. So you'd get areas in like South Patterson and Avondale and whatnot. So uh, what we tried to do is we tried to strip that out. And so I provided an updated table here where, and I did go further beyond uh, the motion. The motion did note 2015, but I felt uh, that it might be useful to provide information from before 2015. So what we have in the left column is new single home builds with no suite. Then the middle column is new single home builds with suite and what percentage that makes up. The only piece on this table that isn't straightforward is on in line 2015 where I have two numbers with a slash. The slash is to differentiate uh, pre-adoption of current regulations and then post-adoption of current regulations. So, so for 2015, prior to the adoption of the regulations, we approved 59 single home bills and then 39 after. So that's just the one piece that requires clarification on that. And apologize for not getting this information to committee earlier. So um, that's the, the data that was requested. And uh, again, uh, 2015 marking the line of the new regs. And then the final part of the motion was to report back to a future committee meeting. So uh, that's what we've done. And I'm open to questions, comments, and discussion. Thank you. Great, uh, great, thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Johnson? Mayor Given. Thanks, uh, Chair Ressi. Uh, Mr. Johnson, is, so the um, industry and BUILD had submitted a specific recommendation uh, for change to the land use bylaw and the cha you know, proposed change to Section 57. Is that, you know, is that uh, proposed change something we can just use off the shelf or does it need to be massaged or anything? Like if, if Council is interested in supporting this, um, yeah, do we need to ask you to, to prepare a change in alignment with that, or can we recommend adopting that change, or just in terms of a, a process question, I guess? Thank you, Chair Bressy. That's a good question. Um, I, I think administration would appreciate the opportunity to work with BUILD if we did see some opportunities to, to tweak it um, so that it works for both parties. Um, I think that it does have the potential to be a little confusing with respect to having two classes of secondary suites. So um, I, I think if a motion was to be made in terms of moving this forward, uh, I would appreciate that it does have the flexibility to allow us to deviate somewhat from the proposal that Bill has submitted. And sorry, just to clarify that, I think what I'm hearing is say, and uh, if, I think what I'm hearing there is if council's direction is we want to, we want to accomplish the goal and what build is hoping to accomplish with this amendment, you could go and do that, but you just like to like a chance to make it a little bit more clear and a little bit less neater. So not necessarily the opportunity to tweak the intent, the intent of it if council doesn't ask you to do that, but just the, just to make it more clear for future use. That's correct, Chair Bressy. Great. Any other questions? Councilor Clayton. And then Mayor Given. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Uh, a question and then a couple of comments. Um, currently, Joe, the uptake uh, in regards to secondary suites is approximately 5%. And, and we have regulations in place to ensure that we don't get another West Point. And so I think it's really proactive and forward thinking for us to show that we're open for business and, and have a desire to work mm -hmm. with the industry. And, and I think that... Um, some of the numbers in the report aren't uh, conducive to, when you first read it, looking like we are interested in 
working with industry. I appreciate that the percentage of increase number is, you know, fairly high. But when you look at the total lots number, it's not really that high. So regardless of what the percentage of increase is, if the number isn't right to begin with, then the percentage of increase doesn't really matter. What matters is having the right number. And so, you know, in your report, you mentioned uh, some pieces uh, under the section that talk about relationship to the city council's focus and strategic directions. But another piece that's sort of a hierarchy to that economy piece is that we want to contribute to a healthy economy that ensures revenues are sufficient to meet community service expectations. So if we have an industry that's willing to spend money and therefore create uh, an economy based on uh, something that we don't currently have the opportunity for, why wouldn't we be willing to look at this? And so my question is, is what is your concern with um, the proposed uh, the pr proposed document from, from BUILD in regards to increasing this? Because uh, we currently, as I mentioned, we have the regulations in place to not get another West Point. So what specifically in the document is a concern to you? So, sorry, I, I think that I'm going to, um, taking a step in just to say that what I heard from Director Glavin is that there's not really a recommendation coming from administration, administration here because we didn't ask administration for a recommendation. We asked for some very specific information and we were very proscriptive in the motion we passed and they brought back the, and they brought back the information that we asked for. And what I heard from Director Glavin is they're asking council, what do you want to do with this? So I think it's a great question to ask council. Hey, do we want to do we want to move forward with this amendment? And what do we hope hope with suites? But I and I think that if we've got specific area, we want to ask for ask for advice on administration on administration. Fine, but I think that it's um, I'm not hearing administration say, administration coming here and saying, hey, please don't do this amendment from build. I'm hearing them say coming here and saying. And, Hey, what do you folks want to do? Well, I guess, Councilor Bressy, my concern is is that uh, uh, in the discussion around the motion, the intent was that administration work with the industry to find a solution. And so bringing back a report that simply says receive this for information, I don't think there's a solution there. And earlier in the year, it was talked that council would meet with industry stakeholders, uh, not just administration. And to my knowledge, that hasn't been executed. So um, my question for for Mr. Johnson was, with currently the uptake only being 5%, what is his concern with going ahead with the proposal from BUILD? Yeah, and uh, sorry, I'm going to rule that question out, out of order towards, towards Mr. Johnson, because I think that we've given specific, um, sorry, I don't, um, I don't, I maybe don't have the recollection around, uh, around um, the discussion of this motion, but what I do have is the specific motion we made in front of it, and mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair to ask administration why they didn't do direction that direction that we didn't give them. So no, I, and that's not my question. My question is, is him as a resource for us and as a knowledgeable person in this. I want to know what his concerns are with the bill proposal. But I haven't heard administration say they've got concerns. About well, there must be concerns when he simply says receive this report for information and industry comes forward and presents ideas and our leading person for this discussion. Won't, you don't think it's appropriate to get imp input from him? I think if you would like to ask for advice, I would be I would be okay with that. But I think to, when we've explicitly had Director Glavin uh, introduce this report by saying we have received for information because that closes off the motion that Council made. But just so you know, what I'm paraphrasing, but what I heard Director Glavin say is that we that the recommendation is received for information to acknowledge that we fulfilled the fulfilled that they've uh, fulfilled the motion that we passed and director glavin also said hey please also we would love direction on what to do with this build build report so my understanding of the recommendation to receive for information is to acknowledge that yes the motion we passed the very specific motion we passed at a previous council meeting was followed through on and actioned on and now that we've seen that information we asked for we get to decide do we want to advance this recommended amendment further well, I guess my concern is, Council Presley, traditionally when this council receives the report for information, it in essence is signifying that we're, we're shelving it. 
And so as a person who can't make a motion on this committee, uh, I think that it's only appropriate that I can ask uh, questions of our resource. I mean, I, I'll wait till it gets to council and ask questions then if, as, as you see this inappropriate. Sure, and the yeah. reason I'm ruling it out of order is because I think that Director Glavin in his introduction to this answered your question of what I'm hearing is the question is why is this received for information? And I think that I heard Director Glavin clearly answer that. And I disagree, but I'll wait till council. Okay, great, and yeah, it's definitely your right to bring that up at council as well. Uh, I, uh, are there any other questions that we'd like to ask? Councillor Pilat. Uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. Uh, I'm just, if I can just clarify, so I, I hope that I wouldn't get this one wrong, but one secondary suite equals one, one up and one down. So two, two units, basically. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Um, no, the, the statistics would just count a secondary suite. So if we took an entire neighborhood, there were 100 lots, um, and we said there were 20 secondary suites, we're just counting the, the, the basement suite, let's call it, as that 20, we don't count the upstairs as an additional unit. Okay, and so just, is it possible to throw that slide back on from the 2010 to 2000 data uh, that you'd went back, with, more than more than was expected, just to kind of give us some history, which was kind of nice to see. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess the number that pops out on for me and for receiving this for information for enough, but something that I think I want to highlight to, to committee and council is in 2012, we had 49% of these built. Um, I'm reading this right, the result, there was 390, 103 units built that year. So that would equate to about 200 residential doors. So that would be like two big apartment buildings going up that weren't being built at the time. So this, they filled the gap. And so when I look at the same thing trending now, 22.2% .2 in 2019, 30% in 2020. If you don't think that these aren't filling an affordable gap, I don't know what out there, there's the data that would kind of show that for me. So I just, I hope that's something council's paying attention to because it is an eye opener for me. Um, my, my other question is, I'm just curious why administration chose to bring back a map that didn't have the actual secondary suites on current locations for lots. I appreciate the, the hypothetical, but why we didn't actually show us exactly what was going on in development by development. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Um, I, I guess we felt that it was uh, reasonable to model what was possible with the existing regulations. Um, in previous workshops that we had with industry and council, I did provide some examples of what had been happening in existing neighborhoods, and I can certainly distribute that to council uh, again, if you so wish. Um, I think one of the problems uh, with looking at existing neighborhoods and saying this is what the results are going to be is that it doesn't really capture what those when those neighborhoods were developed in relation to when the regulations were implemented. So a good example of an area that has been developed out um, after our regulations were adopted is the cobblestone, or no, sorry, um, Westgate East area. And I do have that handy. If the committee would like me to pull it up, I can show you uh, what we are currently seeing with the implementation of the existing regulations. And I think it is probably the most accurate snapshot of how these uh, areas look uh, with our existing regulations. Would committee like to see that? Sure. Sorry, I think you're muted there, Joe. Thank you, sorry. Uh, this is the Westgate East neighborhood. Uh, the area on 105th Avenue was developed prior to the regulations coming in. I by no means I'm trying to draw attention to that area. I'm just saying that that is not uh, reflective of the current regulations. However, the remainder of the neighborhood is an area that I think is a fairly good snapshot of what the existing regulations look like in play. The one area that warrants some explanation is this area over here. I'm assuming you can see my cursor. 
And uh, that is an area that is uh, semi-detached dwellings only, and sec secondary suites are not allowed in semi. So um, that's why you don't see green dots in this area. However, the rest of the neighborhood does have a reasonable dispersion of suites in that area. So um, the comment uh, that uh, we're not seeing those results, I think is dependent on neighborhood by neighborhood. And again, depending on when, uh, when those neighborhoods were developed in relation to the suites or the, the existing regulations coming into place. Okay, no, I really appreciate this map because it's, it's actually, I think why um, why there's some concern around it is because I've drove through this area enough times to know all those little green dots on 107th Ave, pretty much every other lot in there is vacant. Vacant. So those are what's selling right now. That's what's been sold in that area. If, if we could actually drive through and show you that and you could see all the lots around there, you'd see that none of them have homes on them yet. And they can't build any more up downs because it's they've, they've figured out how to get the 50 meter radius as perfectly as they can in there probably, and now they're stagnated to build anymore. So I appreciate that map coming up, and that was I guess why I was curious why we didn't show maps like that because if it came back to the committee, I think something would be educational for us to see is where's the vacant lots, and on the new developments where's currently secondary suites being built, and I think it would show us a pretty good picture of why industry is hoping to. Uh, ask for a little bit of an advancement or a little bit of a variance on this. Great. Thank you. And Mr. Johnson, just so I'm clear, that's the map that's publicly available, available correct? That's correct, Chair Bressy. Great. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Given. And yeah, then Councilor Blackburn. Thanks very much. So, uh, Joe, can you tell me what it is about our current system that uh, prevents, because it looks, sorry, from the information provided, it looks like even with the contingency suites concept added and the additional uh, potential for secondary suite lots that could handle secondary suites, um, that we still don't get the uh, the bunching that we we saw in you know the West Point example that uh, Mr. Rossler showed, or on 105th Ave that you showed there. So, what is it about our current regulation that that appears to prevent the bunching, like getting an entire street of, of secondary suites. Because it looks like in all the examples you showed, even though there would be more secondary suites, we still don't end up with that clustering together. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Yeah, that's a direct result of the three suites within 50 meter radius regulation. And so that is designed to uh, disperse secondary suites throughout the neighborhood and avoid those clusters. That was very strategic regulation that was implemented to achieve that outcome. And, and so that, that, that outcome, I guess, it appears that that outcome is still possible even if uh, we made some allowances that would ultimately allow, allow for more secondary suites. Like is the representations that you showed here, you're confident that that would be the case um, if we implemented this concept? Um, like, thank you, Chair uh, Rossi. Yeah, can you, can you think of a situation where we would get a clustering of secondary suites with the additional sort of availability? Uh, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just share my screen again and go back to the presentation. Um, and pardon me, I'm just trying to navigate a few different windows here. So, and um, I'm assuming you can see my screen. So one of the, well, the, the, the main feature of Bill's proposal is that if a, if a subject property is across the street from something that doesn't have a driveway is effectively what the regulation is. And they provide a number of uh, opportunities for that. So corner lot, side yard, PUL, municipal reserve and whatnot. So in this area where it, fronts across the street from the municipal reserve that is the uh, Roy Bickel school site, mm -hmm. you see that effectively it's every other lot for this area. Now, if you want to, if, I mean, it depends if you call that clustering or not, but that is what you're going to see is you're going to see some areas where it's uh, way more concentrated than by way of our, the mechanisms of our existing regulations. So one, the one thing that I'm a little unsure about is 
when you say, are you reasonably confident that that's the output we're going to get when we apply these regulations? Um, we kicked it around a little bit and we tried it. But in my experience, one thing that sometimes pops up is um, unintended consequences. You don't really know until things start to materialize and you're like, ooh, wow, that we didn't see that one coming. So given that these features or the build proposal is based on all of these features, then the outcome can vary from neighborhood to neighborhood. And so there's some element of unpredictability that I, I can't assure council that we're gonna get some outcome in that regard. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And thanks, uh, Chair Brissett. Yeah, that's helpful, Joe. Um, it gives me a sense of like what the, if that, I, I can't imagine based on what you described another situation where you get more than that representation like it you know there's still some separation so that's uh, that's really helpful thank you great uh council blackburn then councillor clayton thank you councillor bressy um, when we were first presented with the build proposal there was a comment made that the existing bylaw does what we intended for it to do and and, and I would presume that has a lot to do with, with parking and a few other considerations. So my question for you, Mr. Johnson, is do you think that the build proposal um, compromises the uh, goals that were set out in the original bylaw? Thank you, Chair Bressy, and thank you for the question, Councillor Blackburn. That's a very difficult one to answer. Um, I, and I've thought about that quite a bit. Um, so it's difficult to answer is there's no real identifiable point where everything is fine and then all of a sudden there's a problem. So I was trying to think of an analogy and the only one I could think of was the frog in the boiling water story where it's like everything's fine and everything's fine and then all of a sudden the frog's in the boiling water. Um, so I, I don't really have an answer. I don't think that there's, there is an exact point and only in hindsight will you look and say, okay, that, that's actually a problem. And uh, so can I, can I say to council that everything's gonna be okay or there's going to be a problem? No, it's very difficult to, uh, to say. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Yeah, thanks for asking the question, uh, Councillor Blackburn. It was exactly my question in regards to if there was any concerns from direct, from Mr. Johnson. Um, regardless of that, I think that uh, um, the regulatory, uh, the regulations that were in place served the point at the time of what we needed. Right now, we're having a request from industry. There is, um, and industry wouldn't build it if there wasn't people looking to buy it. So if there's a, a need for that missing metal, if there's a need for those types of places, and industry is willing to work with administration, why wouldn't we allow them the opportunity? It not only allows industry an opportunity, it allows our community an opportunity to have things that they need in regards to residential needs. And so rather than just saying, okay, let's open up the secondary suites thing and creating a bunch of work, and we'll probably get a recommendation to hire a, a consultant to work on it, when industry comes with the information free of charge, and they're the experts and they want to work with our experts, I don't see why we wouldn't let this go ahead. Although I can't make a motion at this committee, I would really appreciate and encourage somebody on this committee to allow the conversation to happen so that we can have something brought forward to council that will make the changes that are necessary for us to have a successful industry and a successful residential um, fulfillment in our community. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. And I see Mayor Given wants to get in just because I sense that we're probably getting more towards, uh, uh, well, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to insert myself yet, so I'll insert myself and just say that I've got two hopes. Is one, I really hope that uh, that there is some action taken today to send this to Council in terms of, I think that this is something that very much is a big, is a, is a big important conversation that all of Council ha should have an office at the committee level that something goes to Council for Council to chew on. And also, I know for me, when it comes to secondary suites, I think that this this seems like a well thought out amendment in terms of I think that when there is PULs or when there is side lots, it makes sense to take advantage of those to allow for more opportunity for the market to do the the market to do the market thing. 
I also worry that uh, I, re I really do approach this job, one of the lenses I approach this job with is are people that have the least abilities to speak for themselves and provide for themselves in this community, what's good for them? And I know that there's issues when people end up in an illegal secondary suite. There's safety issues, there's quality of life issues, there's also um, issues in terms of wondering if they can apply for help underneath the Residential Ten Tenancy Act if they need it because they're in an illegal suite. And just, I think that when you don't allow the, uh, when you don't allow sufficient opportunity for legal suites, I don't think it actually stops secondary suites from happening in our community. I just think it drives them, it drives them underground, which isn't good for our community. It means we don't get to tax them, frankly. It means we don't get to plan our infrastructure for them. It also can be very bad for the, bad for the tenants. And so for me, I, I'm very open, at, open to the idea of creating more market opportunity. I think that there's, Things in this, there's little details in this amendment that I might, that that I would maybe wouldn't mind seeing tweaked. But the intent of it overall, to say we're going to create more opportunity with side yards and PULs and, and et cetera, really does make sense to me. So I hope that this will get advanced to council in some form. Uh, Mayor Given. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Chair Brissy. That's uh, why it's important to get a motion on the table because I think there's some uh, of the discussion that was prejudging what might or might not happen here today while well, some of us were still getting information. Um, I'm fully prepared to make a motion uh, to recommend something forward to Council, not to just receive for information. Uh, I would like to agree that, uh, and I think it's really important, administration did exactly what Council, by a motion, asked them to do. Um, get us a whole bunch of information on all these specifics and bring it back. And administration said, here you go, there's your information, up to you guys what you want to do with it. Um, w and that's how it should be. If administration started saying every time a business or businesses wanted something that they immediately did that and made that change without consulting us or asking us if we wanted to do it, well, that's actually a really big problem. Um, so, yeah. I'd, Maybe I just need to get that off my chest. Um, but I will move that the committee recommend, sorry, committee recommend council direct administration, prepare changes to the land use bylaw consistent with the request from build for uh, contingent secondary suites, period. Um, in that motion, uh, you'll hear that I am uh, having committee recommend that council direct administration rather than just committee direct administration, recognizing the point that Councillor Bressy just made, that maybe all of council wants to have a voice on this. Um, so that's why I'm not saying committee direct administration do the change. Uh, if there's a desire to have this go up to all of council so we can affirm that all of council is supportive of that change or at least a majority, then that's great um, and, and appropriate. I, um, you heard me say that uh, I'm supportive, and, and I'll say this explicitly, I'm supportive of uh, the change uh, or a change. And uh, you'll also hear in the motion that it was uh, consistent with the, pro you know, the proposal from, from Build Alberta. And I do that to provide some latitude for uh, administration and industry. You know, if there's some, some rough edges or some implementation that would need to be done uh, slightly differently, then that's fine. Um, but the, if council is willing to support the overall intent to make changes that are consistent with this request um, then, yeah, that's the intent of the motion. Um, I'm supportive of that. What was really helpful to me was seeing the distribution. Um, I appreciated uh, Mr. Johnson referencing the Royal Oaks area um, example. And again, they are only illustrations. That stretch um, along 103, uh, where there gets to be a um, more intense number of secondary suites, um, is, I think, reasonable. Like and it, but I seeing it represented uh, visually like this has been really helpful um, because I think it does avoid the worst examples, which nobody wants, and nobody's saying that industry wants it or council wants it. Um, you know, the 105th example that Joe showed a little while ago, and the West Point. I'm confident that this avoids the worst of that. Um, and Joe's uh, example of the frog in the pot of water is actually a really apt one. Um, there's a point where the water was too hot, and so I think the council today turned it down. Uh, and council now is saying, well, you know what, maybe that's getting a little bit cool and we want to turn it up. Um, that's great. That's a really good response. And we, someday in the future, we may find that it needs to go either direction uh, to respond to conditions, and, and that's totally okay. Um, this is how the process is supposed to work. 
and I think it'll give us a good outcome. So for all those reasons, I'd encourage the committee members to support recommending this forward to council so we can um, hopefully be giving administration direction to make these changes. Great, thank you. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Councillor Bressy, and uh, thank you, Mayor Given, for the motion. I, uh, I just want to say that uh, despite the fact that our delegation was really unable or at least hesitant to talk about what the take-up might be if, uh, if these uh, additional um, suites were allowed, um, I really do think that we have an obligation to do everything that we can to improve the availability of um, affordable market housing. Um, we're trying to we're trying to deal with housing in a number of different ways, and I think this is one very valuable way to do that. And so um, I am in support of the motion. Thank you. Great. Is there any other conversation or debate about this question? Great. Then we do have a motion that I'll call to question. All in favor? And that motion passes unanimously. Any other further business on this that we'd like to carry out? Great, with that, I will move us on to our final item, which is outstanding items list, and that is Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, we'll start off with item 1107. I see this kind of crept back onto the outside on outstanding items list here, but this was actually replaced with uh, item 1114, uh, so that can be removed. Uh, today, we received uh, item 1090 for the construction work in Smith subdivision that was dovetailing with the uh, uh, reception center. Uh, so that has been dealt with. On item 1116, the economic support for downtown businesses, uh, we received that report today in, in the associated direction. And then finally, we have received uh, direction on the secondary suites uh, regulation to bring uh, that forward. And all the other items currently on the list uh, are on track. Great, thank you. Um, any questions about the outstanding items list? Can I get a motion to receive? Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Um, I move that we accept the outstanding items list as amended. Great, uh, any conversation or debate? I'll call to that question, all in favor? And that motion carries unanimously. So with that, I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.